Okay, welcome to this Counterfire event celebrating and commemorating 150 years since the Paris Commune. The Paris Commune was the first workers' state the world had ever seen. It began as a popular uprising in 1871 during the Franco-Prussian War when the French government attempted to disarm the working class soldiers of the National Guard who took control of the city in response. Uh, in refusing to accept the authority of the French government, they established a number of policies, including the right to, to, for workers to control their workplaces, uh, an end to child labor, reductions in uh, rent and debt, and self-policing, among others. Women played a central role in the commune. It lasted 72 days uh, and has inspired struggles for equality and against oppression ever since. We have a brilliant lineup of speakers over two sessions this afternoon to discuss the origins of the commune, uh, its significance, and how it can inform the struggles of the present. My name is Faisi Ismail, and I will be chairing uh, this first session. I teach at Goldsmiths, uh, where we are undertaking industrial action in the form of a marking boycott, which is now in its uh, 12th week. And we decided to take this action because management is using the pandemic to cut jobs and weaken our working conditions. 120 redundancies are on the table. Um, they want to cut courses that are not seen as profitable and they essentially want us to make to, to work harder for less pay. The union has overwhelmingly rejected management's proposals in response to our uh, boycott. And if we win this dispute, I think it will show that workers at every university can win uh, and that there are alternatives to uh, cutting jobs. And um, I think the issues that will be discussed today um, will be inspiring for our struggle, but also for struggles uh, taking place in every sector across the country. Uh, so I will introduce um, each speaker in turn. They will speak for 10 to 12 minutes each. Uh, we'll then have questions from the floor. Uh, and then, um, uh, and I would, yeah, and I would encourage people to, to ask questions, to, to make contributions, um, particularly women. Um, and then speakers will sum up for about five minutes each. And when you're called to speak, just to note, you will get a message from the host asking you to unmute yourself. So um, everyone else will be muted uh, throughout the sessions. So our first speaker is John Westmoreland. John is a historian, a former teacher and UCU rep. He's an active member of the People's Assembly and writes regularly for Counterfire. Two of his articles, one on the Paris Commune and the other on August Blanqui, uh, are on the Counterfire website. Um, and John will be speaking about the working class in the Paris Commune. John. OK, thanks very much, Faisy. Um, between March and May 1871, the working class of Paris ran the show. And it's an astonishing story. The simple reason that the working class were regarded by the French ruling class as the scum of the earth. Yet these people ran Paris honestly, humbly, without trying to make money out of it, and they ran it better than the government with which they, which they had to fight. Now it's often said by right-wing historians who want to belittle the achievements of the Commune that it was an accident. It was an accident caused by the Franco-Prussian War and the fact that Paris ended up being besieged for the best part of a year. And uh, this is clearly a calumny. This, is not, this isn't true at all. France declared war against Prussia in July 1870. By September, Napoleon III was a prisoner of the Prussians. Immediately, the workers in Paris said, this government's a failure, it's useless, we want rid of it, and a republic was declared two days later. But it was a republic of traitors, a republic of monarchists. The head of the republic, the so-called government of national defense was General Trochu. General Trochu said he was going to govern for God, the family, and for private property. So not really a republic at all. And it was made absolutely clear that the Prussians weren't the main enemy that France was facing. In the minds of the French ruling class, the main enemy was resident in Paris. It was the French working class. And I just want to say a little bit about that because the French working class had a tremendous revolutionary tradition. 
in the 1848 revolution in what's called the June days, the bourgeoisie massacred French workers who'd taken to the streets to fight for uh, a fairer constitution, uh, a civil constitution for them. The Republic that came in 1848 was overthrown just a few years later and a dictatorship by uh, Louis Bonaparte, who called himself the Emperor Napoleon III, had a high opinion of himself, he, he took over the running of France. And you have to understand something about the Second Empire to understand what the Commune was all about. Marx summed it up in one word. He wasn't the only person to call it this word. It was rotten. The Second Empire was in the shop window. It was all about the glories of empire, you know, the glories of the French military, uh, titles, Duke of this, you know, and etc. But the reality was that it was a free for all for capitalists. There was fantastic opportunities for investors and for swindlers. And the people of Paris felt this very acutely. The mayor of Paris was a man called Baron Haussmann. He was in charge of gentrifying Paris, building boulevards, building public squares, which are all very pretty and tree land and so on, and forcing the French working class back into the suburbs. So the French, so the Second Empire had this glorious facade underneath. It was a, a, a rotten thing. And I just want to say quickly what working class life was like. It was estimated that about 50% of Parisian women, working class women, had to work as prostitutes to supplement their wages. Wages were terribly low. Even in skilled enterprises like engineering, wages were very, very low. Education was pitiful. Uh, people weren't equipped to participate in public life. And workers felt that their value of their labor was completely you know, um, cast aside. So what the people of France wanted wasn't just a republic. They wanted a social republic. They wanted the social questions to be addressed. And the so-called government of national defense, which replaced, which Trochu led, which replaced uh, the Second Empire, proved in practice to the Parisian workers that they couldn't be trusted and that they weren't on their side. Um, in January, that government made peace with the Prussians who were uh, surrounding Paris in order that they could work together, the French government uh, and the Prussian, uh, the Bismarck-led Prussian army could work together to crush Paris. And so with that in mind, when they tried to disarm the Paris by seizing the cannons on Montmartre in March, uh, 1871, the working class responded and responded massively. The 300,000 people in the National Guard in Paris, everybody who was capable of bearing arms, rallied to the cause of defence in Paris. And the working class uh, were basically the commune which was elected. So what did they achieve? What did the working class achieve? Well, they achieved what Engels called the dictatorship of the proletariat. Really, what they did was they, they undictatorshiped what the ruling class was doing to them. They took over the instruments of repression that had been used against them, and they locked off what was offensive. Then they staffed the areas of the state which were useful, and they put them to their own use. For example, they got rid of the police that spied on the socialist clubs, but they wanted to uphold public safety. Army soldiers who deserted the army and turned on their officers, obviously had to have a democratic mandate for electing their own officers. So what you see is the end of the standing army, the end of conscription and uh, the, the, the use of the, of a, of a, of a state forces. To, to support the, the workers' democracy. The workers' democracy itself is celebrated. The Parisian workers elected their delegates to the commune and, give, and had the right to recall them if they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They ended uh, career politics. You know, they, they got rid of uh, all the sinecures. The, the wage for everybody in the commune was a mere 6,000 francs. So there was no you know, harvesting of taxpayers' money as we see today in politics. So the workers' democracy was, was real and vibrant. 
and Marx called it an expansive form of government. And what he meant by that was that when workers took over the city, they were obliged to push outwards and solve other questions which affected workers. I've only got time to go through a few of them. But clearly, the commune was at once anti-imperialist, anti-racist. All Polish workers, many Polish workers in Paris, were made citizens. Uh, general Dobrovsky was a, was a Polish general in the National Guard. He was, you know, he played a prominent part, part in the affairs of the commune. Uh, later on in the commune, towards the end of the commune, they pulled down the Vendome column, which celebrated French imperial victory. It was made of the bronze cannons that Napoleon had captured. And they thought that that was chauvinistic. It was an insult to workers abroad to celebrate warfare. So they pulled down the Vendome column. And they said that the flag of the commune was the flag of the World Republic. By the way, it's the flag that Lenin wanted to be interred with in his, uh, when he died. So the, this expansive form of government explains why the French government and the Prussian army blockaded France so effectively. And Marx makes the case that had that form of government continued to flourish, it would have linked up with communes in other French cities, in Toulouse, in Marseille, in Lyon, where other communes were being formed. And then it would have been able to address the question of what to do about this wretched government that was besieging them. Um, I think also, Marx argues, that it would have addressed for peasants many of the issues that they faced, land tax and so on, but that's perhaps beyond my uh, remit. Now, in hindsight, a lot of people have criticised the commune, people on the left as well as people on the right. And in particular, the commune failed because it didn't have a concentrated, uh, established leadership. Um, it takes time to develop a revolutionary leadership. And to be honest, the, 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 the communards hadn't got a recognized uh, leading authority with which you know, to, to lead the, 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 the military fight that they needed to have. And the result of that was that there were constant arguments between the commune and between the National Guard uh, uh, and so on. Now that, basically, that is a, a, again a calumny. In France, in Paris, before the Commune was, uh, came about, there were thousands of Parisian workers attending the social clubs in Northern Paris, thousands of them. And they discussed overthrowing the government and why the Second Empire was rotten and all these things. You know, there was a clear socialist consciousness within the Commune. Um, and they were pioneers. They, they explored new ways of governing new ways of doing business. But of course they made mistakes. You know, they should have marched on Versailles. They should have had a much more concentrated military attack on the government of Versailles. It was a government of traitors and of useless idiots. And they could have got rid of them. There was the popular feeling against the government to take them on. Whether or not they'd have won, I don't know. But they could have done. Engels was really sort of dismayed that they never took over the Bank of France, that that would have brought the government which had fled Paris and gone to Versailles, that would have brought them to their knees. But the well, final the chapter, later. yeah, I'm finishing off now. The, the final chapter is the bloody week at the suppression of the commune. And, and, you know, I mean, people perhaps know the stories of women, bourgeois women stabbing chained prisoners in the face with the spikes on their umbrellas. There's something like 100,000 Parisians maimed, killed, exiled uh, in the suppression of that thing. And what it amounts to, the violence of Bloody Week, is two things. The French capitalist government was humiliated by the Prussian victory. They, they, they tore off the veil of the Second Empire and made them look pathetic. And the Parisian working class governed better, more humbly, more honestly and more democratically. It was a better government than the capitalists could provide and that explains the bloodshed. Thanks so much, John. That's an excellent um, introduction. Our next speaker is Clara Blessing. Uh, Clara is a researcher at the University of Utrecht. Uh, she's working on the cultural memory of women activists, including Louise Michel, and she will be speaking about Louise Michel and the women of the Paris Commune. Thanks, Clara.
Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, one second. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit today about the women of the Paris Commune and in particular the activist Louise Michel, who you can see here in this image as depicted in Brian and Mary Talbot's recent graphic novel about Louise Michel. I want to give a sense about how in particular the women of the Commune were represented both during the days of the Commune and subsequently in order to think, I hope, about some of the ways in which the commune might be of interest in contemporary feminist socialism. So, as we've already heard, women were involved in the commune from the very start. The insurrection offered an opportunity for women, especially working class women, to mobilize in a call for equal rights and an end to both gender and class-based inequality. Indeed, the commune itself was catalyzed by the actions of working women when they stood between guards and the cannons they came to remove in Montmartre on the 18th of March, 1871. Using their body as, bodies as shields, they stopped the guards removing the cannons, causing the guards to turn on their own general in an act that has since been heralded as the start of the commune. Although they were not allowed to run for office and therefore could not be part of the commune's official government, women played a central part in the commune's organization and activity. They set up political collectives that talked about gender and social discrimination. They created unions, they wrote newspapers, they produced treaties. They went onto the streets to demonstrate and they went onto the battlefields as nurses um, and as cooks. They helped build the barricades that protected the city against the Versailles army. And in the violent bloody week, which ended the commune, women were killed alongside men in their thousands. Most of these women would not necessarily have identified themselves as feminists. In fact, the sort of rights-based or civic demands that were being made by their contemporary women's rights activists were on the whole pretty irrelevant to them. But in the very act of moving into and occupying public space, these communard women constituted a defiant challenge to the gender and the class roles of their day, embodying what we now call feminist socialism. That is not to say that these communards formed a unified um, movement with a specific set of demands, but to insist that despite a range of really diverging attitudes, women's emancipation was at the heart of the commune. By far the most famous woman of the commune was the activist Louise Michel, who's been described by the British historian of anarchism, George Woodcock as a secular saint, and was described by the American Russian anarchist, Emma Goldman as the priestess of pity and vengeance. Michelle was born in 1830 and she died in 1905. She spent the months of the commune organizing groups and associations that were vital for its protection and management. She treated those injured on the barricades. She gave rabble rousing speeches at the communard clubs and dressed in a soldier's uniform and armed with a rifle, she fought against the repressive forces of the French state. At the end of the Commune, on December the 17th, 1871, Michelle was put on trial. And although she was unrepentant, accepting responsibility not only for her actions, but also for a litany of false accusations, she was not executed by the French state who feared turning her into a martyr. Instead, Michelle was exiled to New Caledonia, where she went on to assist the indigenous Kanak people in an uprising against French imperialism before returning to France in 1880 and continuing to advocate her anarchist politics in well-attended lectures across the country and abroad. 
She wrote extensively about her life, about her experiences of the commune and about her political ideas. And in fact, hers is one of the first, the clearest first-hand accounts we still have about the workings of the commune. Calling for the complete destruction of the prevailing social order so that a new equal society could come to be, Michelle championed the causes of the oppressed, the downtrodden, whether they were women, imperial subjects, or even animals. Michelle was an early vegetarian. She was in her day seen as a powerful political force, revered by many, but also reviled by some. For instance, in this 1881 cartoon of her from the journal Le Gralo, which was a Republican and anti-communard publication, um, the cover image epitomizes many of the depictions of Michelle as an unnatural and dangerous woman. In line with other descriptions of female activists from this period, she is androgynous. She is depicted neither as a man, but nor is she particularly well suited to the stereotypes of 19th century femininity. Her only companion is a witch's familiar the black cat of anarchism, a feral animal to accompany a feral woman. And in this sorcerer's lair, Michelle's drooping hat points towards her victim, a bust of the anti-commune statesman, Leon Gambetta. This quasi-mythical figure who rejects all expectations of 19th century femininity has just returned from exile and clearly represents a great threat to the status quo. What I'm drawing on here is the work of the historian Gay L. Gullickson, who notes that the actions of female communards were considered far more noteworthy than those of their male comrades. Turning them into targets of expressions of larger political or moral judgments about the working of the commune itself. The women of the commune were often reduced to a series of stereotypes which were seen to embody the successes and failures of the commune's project. The power of these depictions came from their ability to convey wider moral and political panic, both about gender and class. The women communards were perceived as more cruel or dangerous than the men, and the insurrection was framed as a hysterical or a feminine endeavor. In stepping out onto the streets and enthusiastically participating in violence, women were understood to have resisted or even broken down the prevailing social order and the expectations of femininity that came with it. In its most virulent form, this inspired representations of women communard as petroleurs, a negative allegory of angry and destructive femininity imagined as heathens or as Amazons who wreaked havoc setting property on fire, the petroleurs combined sexual and political threat. Accounts of the commune in which they featured compared them to the furies of Greek mythology, to mad women, to witches, to wild animals, and included the regular claim that they wandered the streets of Paris bare-breasted because the sexual, the sexual ferocity of the petroleurs was an important part of her depiction. The alarm generated by this figure was such that at the end of the commune, women were put on trial simply because they looked like they might be petroleurs. The petroleurs would go on to be one of the 19th century's most powerful anti-feminist symbols, a threat to both the domestic sphere and to wider society. Demonizing the communard as out of control and as savage, the figure of the petroleurs works to minimize the political engagement of the women who participated in the commune, standing as demonstration that patriarchal control takes symbolic and narrative as well as practical forms. But in many ways, Louise Michel offers a counterexample to the demonization or the erasure of the women of the commune. When she died, her coffin was paraded through the streets of Paris to large crowds and rapturous applause. And since her death, her life has been continuously reassessed, mythologized, 
and in some versions absorbed into a mainstream French national historical narrative. In this context, Michelle is not so much remembered as a radical activist and is often detached from the memory of the commune. Instead, she comes to represent a set of often unspecific and progressive values. In fact, she is the only woman to have a Parisian metro station named after her. And as this statue attests, she is celebrated as a teacher or a nurturer, not necessarily as somebody who wanted to assassinate the president. Meanwhile, Michelle does hold a different position within international anarchist circles, in which she is often listed as a renowned historical example alongside figures like Kropotkin, Proudhon, and Bakunin. Accounts of her activism have also had a place in anti capitalist women's movements and in aid of various left wing causes. Indeed, the Spanish Civil War saw not one but two battalions named after her. I'd like to consider also the fact that last year, when the artist Banksy financed a lifeboat to rescue refugees from the Mediterranean, he named it after Louise Michel. And to end with the question what does this tell us? about the role of Louise Michel and the women of the commune today. Thank you. That's brilliant, Clara, thanks so much. Um, and uh, just to say that uh, Counterfire is organizing a forum on the roots of women's oppression and it's, um, uh, and, and it's and the roots, uh, on, the, on women's oppression on the roots and, and its roots in class society, sorry, and what this means for the struggle of, uh, for women's liberation. And that's gonna be this Saturday at 2 p.m. if you want to come along. Um, thanks. Um, so our next speaker is Michael Rosen. Michael is children's laureate uh, and visiting professor at Goldsmiths. Um, he has written an introduction to William Morris's The Pilgrims of Hope, which is an epic poem about the Paris Commune. And that's going to be published in a new edition um, with his introduction uh, by Redwood's books uh, very soon. And Michael's also been a, a, an important figure in holding the government to account over COVID um, and the crisis. Um, and he will now be speaking about culture and the Paris Commune. Michael. Thank you very much, Faisy. This is going to be a very quick survey of various people who've responded to the Paris Commune. And uh, we're going to begin with something which I think is really interesting. So maybe Shabir can play us in, please. Und zählen wir nicht. Sie haben Gefängniswärter und Richter, die viel Geld bekommen und zu allem bereit sind. Ja, wozu denn? Glauben Sie denn, dass Sie uns damit klein kriegen? Sie verschwinden und das wird bald sein, werden Sie gemerkt haben, dass Ihnen das alles nichts mehr ist. Ihnen das alles nicht verletzt. Sie haben Zeitungen und Druckereien, um uns zu bekämpfen und mundtot zu machen. Ihre Staatsmänner zählen mir nicht. Sie haben Pfaffen und Professoren, die viel Geld bekommen und zu allem bereit sind. Ja, wozu denn? Müssen Sie denn die Wahrheit so fürchten? Wie sie verschwinden und das wird bald sein, werden sie gemerkt haben, dass ihnen das alles nichts mehr nützt. Dass ihnen das alles nichts mehr nützt. Sie haben Tanks und Kanonen, Polizisten und Soldaten. Ja, wozu denn? Haben sie denn so mächtige Feinde? Sie glauben, da muss doch ein Halt sein, der sie die Stürzenden stützt. 
eines Tages und das wird bald sein, werden sie sehen, dass ihnen alles nichts nützt. Und dann können sie doch so laut halt schreien, weil sie weder Tank noch Kanone mehr schützt. Und dann können sie noch so laut halt schreien, weil sie weder Tank noch Kanone mehr schützt. Thank you very much. Am I still on? Yes, good. So that was Nina Hagen there, who was singing either her adaptation or someone else's of a song from this play. Uh, this is Bertolt Brecht, Days of the Commune, Die Tage der Kommune in German. Um, and there's a, a song there by Brecht with Hans Eisler's music. Um, and I think we could describe that really as a sort of response to a response because Brecht's play was written in 4849, first performed in 56. Um, and Brecht's play is a, a typical work by Brecht in the sense that it's very programmatic and tells the history of the commune um, uh, in a variety of very swift flowing scenes. Um, and he used as his sources an edited collection of papers from 1871, Karl Marx's essay on the commune that we've already heard about, and a play by a Norwegian playwright called Nordal uh, Grieg. And in the play, which is across 14 scenes, we move very swiftly from like a small cafe in Montmartre. We see Thiers, who was the collaborationist uh, uh, leader of the, of the French aristo of the French bourgeoisie, Thiers in his bath. Uh, we see people capturing the cannons. We see workers making fun of Bismarck. We see placards uh, displaying um, the, uh, the declarations of the commune. So you can see that the style of it it may be familiar to those people who know something like uh, Oh, What a Lovely War, that Brechtian technique of using quick scenes between different layers in society with songs that make as clear as we could see with Nina Hagen's style there in that very sort of thumping, jazzy sort of style. Um, and so uh, it's well worth looking up. There are two versions of it you can find in English. This old one that's out of print, uh, which is the old Methuen edition, uh, this one here. And there's also an edition translated by uh, David Constantine in Brecht's Complete Plays. This one is translated by Clive Barker and Arno Reinfrank. So I'm saying I'm going to whiz through as a bit of a survey. So for people to use, if you're interested in get your pencils and paper out or however else you document things for a resource to find out, well, what were the popular songs like during the commune? Then if you speak French and read French, there's a wonderful little book, which I haven't been able to get hold of, but I've been able to look into some of it. It's called La Chanson de la Commune. In other words, the song of or song of the commune. Chansons et poèmes inspirés par la commune de 1800. 60 uh, eons. And that's by Robert, Robert Bracy, B-R-E-C-Y. But if you want to get a flavor of it, um, rather nicely on uh, YouTube, you can actually find some of these popular songs. Um, so if you uh, Google Paris Lights Up, Songs of the Paris Commune, all right, I won't give you the full address, you'll find uh, the songs being sung and one of them, one of my favorites, is by the great singer Georges Brassens, if you know his singing. Um, and one of the songs there is by Marchand and Aristide Bruant. And I think that's the same Aristide Bruant that you see on the Toulouse Lautrec poster that everyone looks at him sneering over his shoulder with a black a hat and a black coat and a red, a red scarf. I think it's the same Bruant, I may be wrong. All right, so if you want to hear the songs, the popular songs of the time, that's one of the best ways to get at it. Paris lights up songs of the Paris Commune. Meanwhile, in kind of high art terms, we've got a couple of responses that we can comment on. One is by Arthur Rambo, uh, Rambo um, who was only 17 at the time and had run away from his uh, bourgeois upbringing um, to Paris before the Commune had started. And people are 99% certain he was actually in the Commune uh, in that time. So Rambo's dates 1854 to 1891. And he's known generally as being a very kind of scandalous, excessive, um, if you like, transgressive kind of writer. And, um, you know, we have to forgive him for his <coughs> adolescence, ex adolescent excess, if you like. So he wrote three poems which are thought to be um, 
part of a response to the Paris Commune, one of them uh, translated uh, by Sebastian Hayes as the hands of Mary Jane in French, uh, Les Mains de Jeanne-Marie, um, Les Mains de Jeanne-Marie, and you get an idea if I just read you one verse in English, these hands will break your backbones clean though pure as snow or ice. These hands are deadlier than machines and stronger than a vice. And in French comes out as, uh, ce sont des ployeurs de chine, des mains qui ne font jamais mal, plus fatal que des machines, plus forte que tout un cheval. Uh, he missed out the horse there, Sebastian. He was going for a kind of populist form, which is what um, uh, Rambo was going for at that particular moment. He also wrote a poem called Chant de Guerre Parisien, a uh, war song, a uh, Parisian war song, if you like. Um, and this is again even more kind of excessive and so on. Here's a, one verse from it. Le grand ville a le pavé chaud malgré vos douches de pétrole et décidément il nous faut vous secouer dans votre rôle. The big city has hot cobblestones in spite of your showers of paraffin and decidedly we shall have to liven, up, liven you up in your parts. And then he wrote another excessive poem called uh, L'Orgie Parisienne, the Parisian orgy, which has a verse, syphilitic, fou, roi, pantin, ventriloque. Qu'est-ce que ça peut faire à la putain, Paris, vos âmes et vos corps, vos poisons et vos loques? Elle se secourra de vous, hargneux, pourri. Which uh, translates as syphilitics, madmen, kings, puppets, ventriloquists. What can you matter to Paris the whore, your souls or your bodies, your poisons or your rags? She'll shake you off, you pox rotten snarlers, as I think, uh, if I can get the translator right for that. Um, I can't for the minute. So anyway, oh, uh, Bernard, Bernard is a translator of that. Meanwhile, much uh, sort of nobler figure, if you like, Victor Hugo, 1802 to 1885. You can't describe Hugo's place in French high culture, a kind of Dickens meets Wordsworth meets, I don't know, um, Ruskin, all sorts of people, um, a poet, a playwright, um, and uh, a, a huge, a huge figure. And he wrote a, a poem translated by Michael Partridge called On a Barricade. You can find all these things online, by the way, um, which begins, Sur une barricade au milieu des pavés, souillé d'un sang coupable et d'un sang pur lavé, un enfant de 12 ans est pris avec des hommes. Es-tu de cela, toi? L'enfant dit, nous en sommes. C'est bon, dit l'officier. On va te fusiller. Attends ton tour, which translates as on a barricade amidst the cobbles, dirtied with guilty blood and cleaned with pure blood. A boy of 12 was taken alongside the men. Do you belong to them? The child said, I do. That's good, said the officer. We're going to shoot you. Wait your turn. And so what plays out is a drama, if you like, on the barricades. Uh, Hugo himself uh, was not a pro communard he was ambivalent about it, um, as quite often high art people are, um, and said basically a kind of plague on both your sides, both your houses, uh, you're both violent in your own ways. So that was just a very, very brief survey, if you like, of some responses. Um, do look up the popular song site. Uh, I'll give it to you once more, uh, just in terms of um, you being able to find your way to it in the way that I did. One second. Paris Lights Up, Songs of the Paris Commune. And as I say, you can find Georges Brassin singing there, Un Chant Révolutionnaire, with a song by Marchand and Bruant, Aristide de Bruant. And then we come to William Morris, um, English, as you all know, 1834 to 1896, Marxist, poet, textile designer, printer, political activist and organiser, and he produced a fascinating book that we've uh, reproduced, um, re republished as Pilgrims of Hope, William Morris, that's what he calls it. There's an introduction by me, but there's also uh, a lot of other work in, in the book put together by Roger Huddle uh, for, for Red Words, uh, that's, and you can get that through bookmarks. And you'll find in there Engel's piece on, um, on, on the commune as well as um, some essays on, on, the Pil on Pilgrims of Hope itself, uh, one particularly by Nicholas Salmon. Um, and the, it's a very interesting and experimental piece of work. So people come to Morris's poetry, you first of all have to kind of um, 
get yourself ready for the fact that he wrote in a deliberately antiquated style. In his own way, it was a way of resisting what was the kind of poetry that was going on at the time. So to our ears and eyes, sometimes it doesn't feel like, how can this person who gives these incredible speeches to the working class in Britain, uh, who edited Commonweal, um, the Journal of the Socialist League and so on, how could he write these strange, antiquated, sort of seemingly sentimental poetry? Um, and in, in fact, Pilgrims of Hope is very different. It was experimental. If I just run you through it very quickly, uh, there are 13 sections of it and we have it's been described by Florence Booz as a mixture between romantic pastoralism and aggrieved realism. That, that's quite a nice summary of it. And we have Richard, who's the main narrator. Uh, for some mysterious reason, his partner and wife in the book um, is unnamed, and she is also a narrator. There's their child, who plays a very important role in the plot at the very end. There's a Frenchman who, as it were, convinces Richard that he has to go, Richard and his wife and child go to the commune uh, where the wife is killed. Um, and then there is also Arthur. And there is, in fact, a love triangle between Arthur, Richard and, in inverted commas, the wife. And so it's set, first of all, in a rural place, then London and then Paris and the commune. And the London part of the story involves uh, imprisonment because uh, Richard has resisted, um, uh, has resisted the, as a demonstration against the kind of militarism and imperialist um, jingoism of the time. And I find it absolutely fascinating because it's, it is experimental. Some people don't like it because it doesn't follow a conventional plot form. We switch narrators. The verse form changes, sometimes it's very long line, rhymes it rhymes in couplets, other times it's in the more standard uh, uh, where alternate lines are, are rhymed. And what is for me interesting about it is it's probably the first, and not many of them, example of a blend of the personal, social and political. You can see Morris struggling with his own politics, his own personal life, and trying to weigh up you know, the dilemmas facing the politically engaged. And he's done it through the medium of looking at this love triangle. Uh, well, starting off with, with the love relationship between Richard and, sorry, the wife, um, but also the dilemmas of love triangles and what that throws up um, and coming through that, but also in the context in the last sections of the poem of the commune and what that does for them and how that influences them. So he was grappling with you know, that well-known idea within Marx of the base and the superstructure. How are our personal lives affected by what's going on politically with the balance of class forces? Uh, and uh, how does that affect us? And how, on a rare occasions, do our own subjective uh, lives affect what's going on around us in some broader way? And so he tries to grapple with these. And small wonder, you know, some people find it not terribly successful in their terms. But I say it's well worth the effort to read it and to find it. And as I say, to plug the book again, it's all right, there's no royalties for me, um, with this beautiful design uh, by uh, William Morris on the front. And there it is, Pilgrims of Hope, William Morris, with an introduction by me. Thank you very much. So that's a very rapid survey of some of the cultural responses uh, to the commune. Uh, do do have a look at the Victor Hugo poem and the uh, the, the Rambo ones. Uh, Rambo for this kind of crazed, um, young excessiveness, if you like, and Hugo for a very dramatic scene. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for having me. That's fantastic, Michael. Thank you so much. That was so illuminating. Um, okay, our, our next um, and final speaker for this session is Kate Connolly. Kate is a counterpart member, a historian, and she's also the biographer um, of Sylvia Pankhurst. And she's currently writing a book on Marx and the Paris Lumpen proletariat. And um, Kate will be speaking about uh, Karl Marx on the Paris Commune. Kate. Oh, thank you very much. Um, that's a really hard act to follow. Um, I'm going to start with a quote, um, with two quotes. Uh, first of all, a complete and disgraceful overthrow of order and authority. The mob is master of Paris. That was the Illustrated London News' first report on the Paris Commune. Women are armed. Mob law is triumphant. That's the Daily Telegraph. Anarchy has set in. 
Murder, treachery and cowardice have again disgraced Paris. That was the Pall Mall Gazette's first report on the Paris Commune. And I wanted to start with those quotes from the English press on the outbreak of the Paris Commune, because I think today we know the, the kind of sepia photographs of um, the people standing on barricades. And it's quite easy to forget that at the time, these people were not regarded as legitimate revolutionaries, let alone heroes. They were regarded as criminals, as thieves, as murderers, as the scum of the earth. And that's very important context, I think, when we remember that Karl Marx himself, who was a revolutionary, he participated in the 1848 revolutions in Europe and was in exile when the commune happened, he was in exile in London, that he sided uncompromisingly with the Paris communards. And to some extent, he didn't have to. Um, there were lots of different political positions um, inside of the, the Paris Commune and the political organisation that Marx had helped found um, and which he was identified with, but also comprised lots of different political viewpoints, um, the International Working Men's Association, that was by no means in the majority in the, the Paris government in, under the Commune. And of course, it ended in a failure. Thousands of people were slaughtered on the streets of Paris. And before the commune broke out, Marx said that an uprising in these circumstances um, in a city that was under siege would have been a dangerous folly or a desperate folly um, is, is the quote. But when the commune did break out, Marx didn't sit back and just wait for it to fail so that afterwards he could maybe write some smug column in a newspaper saying, well, I was right all along. See, this is a validation um, of, my, of my views. Once it had broken out, Karl Marx strove with absolutely everything that he had to make the Paris Commune as successful as it could possibly be. He was consulted by some of the leading communards. We know that there's not all of his correspondence survived the Paris Commune, um, but fragments of his letters to the uh, leading communards, uh, or some of them who, who sought his advice, has survived. He wrote hundreds of letters trying to galvanize international support for the Paris Commune. He wrote to the press to challenge misrepresentations of the Paris Commune. And once it had been defeated, he supported the exiles who managed to escape, those that got to London. And this is also important because these, to some extent, weren't really like the exiles in 1848. Some of those exiles of that previous generation of revolutionaries, some of them were quite well known. Um, some of them spoke other European languages. Some of them were celebrated. But the commune exiles were in the majority, they were working class, they were poor, many of them didn't speak any other languages and they were almost, so they were universally despised by, by the establishments across Europe. And Marx supported them, even doing things like um, apparently intervening with their landladies um, who were angry that these new foreign tenants um, didn't have any money to, to pay their rent. So Marx went and, and argued with them. And he also wrote a pamphlet um, called The Civil War in France. He wrote this very, very quickly. Um, he managed to finish it um, only days after the commune had been defeated. He wrote it in English, which wasn't his first language. And this was an enormously popular pamphlet. Um, it went through three editions in just two months. 8,000 copies were sold of the second edition. Now this book, if Marx had said in this book that the commune was just great, or if on the other hand, Marx had said um, that he knew all along it was, it was going to fail, this wouldn't be a particularly useful book. But instead what Marx did was he looked at what we can learn from the experience of the commune, what we can learn from working class struggle. And that's why it's useful. Um, Lenin, the leader of the Bolshevik revolution in 1917, was reading the civil war in France. And Lenin noticed that this look that Marx gave to the Paris Commune was something that provided the only change that he wanted to make to the Communist Manifesto, that book um, 
that Marx co-authored with um, his lifelong collaborator Friedrich Engels in 1848. So in the 1872 preface to the Communist Manifesto, so written just a year after the Paris Commune, Marx quoted from the civil war in France, this insight that the Paris Communards had taught him. And that was this, this is the quote. The working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and wield it for its own purposes. And this is because the state in capitalist society, although it can look as though it's separate or independent from society, in fact operates in the interest of the dominant class in that societies. Now, as Marx knew, capitalist societies can operate with all different forms of state. Marx was um, writing in a period where, where France had just got rid of over 20 years of an imperialist dictatorship, replaced that with a republic. Today, we live in a parliamentary democracy and constitutional monarchy. But what all of these states under capitalism have in common, despite all these different forms, is that economic questions, those things that determine what our lives are going to be like fundamentally, whether we're going to be able to afford to buy food, whether we're going to be able to afford to put a roof over our heads, whether we're going to own many houses or whether we're going to have to pay extortionate rents just to have some kind of shelter, the things that determine all of the power relationships in society, all of those questions are beyond democratic control. And any attempt to bring them under democratic control and you find the state steps in very, very quickly, whether that's the police or the judiciary or parliament passing anti-trade union laws. And so because the state is designed to oppress working class people, the project of working class emancipation can't be reduced to simply putting the right people inside of it. In fact, recent experience has shown what the state will do to stop even that from happening. And I'm thinking, of course, about Jeremy Corbyn, who was not even in government, simply leading the opposition in Parliament, faced the threat of mutiny from the army, was briefed against in the newspapers by the ex-head of the armed forces, was briefed against by the civil service, had parliamentarians um, from all political parties trying to undermine him. Um, I would argue was being undermined almost on a daily basis, it seemed, by the BBC, and you could go on and on. To achieve working class emancipation, we need to organize society fundamentally differently. And in the first instance, that means the state needs to be under working class control. And because we're not talking about a small group of people, a minority of people in society, that necessarily means the expansion of democracy. And that's what, that's what Marx saw happening in the Paris Commune. That's why he was so excited about it. Under the Commune, all positions of power were elected and those representatives um, who, were, who were put into those positions were also immediately recallable. So as Marx wrote, this was completely superior to parliamentary democracy, for example. And the way that he expressed this, I think, is worth quoting in Marx's own words because it's so powerful uh, and because it seems to say so much about today. He said, instead of deciding once in three or six years which member of the ruling class was to misrepresent the people in parliament, universal suffrage was to serve the people. And this democratic control of society was exactly what led to that rapid transformation of society um, that, that John Westmoreland opened um, today's conference by describing. And I, I think stressing just how extraordinary that was is so important. It was rapid. It did um, stretch into every section of society. And after all, this happened in only 72 days in a city that was under siege. And Marx knew that those very significant achievements were very important because they showed that another world was possible in practice, that it, it had been done. This was the proof of it. And so he went to huge lengths to try and get the truth out of what was happening in Paris and to spread the news about what was happening um, and just how, how fast it was happening. 
because he knew that the representations or misrepresentations in the newspapers that I started off with, um, he knew that the mass slaughter that ended the Paris Commune were efforts to wipe out what was really happening, to prevent anything like that ever happening again. And what Marx understood was that the memory and knowledge and analysis of what had happened in those 72 days in Paris could help inspire and inform struggles in the future. And I think that's why his writings are so vital for us in our struggles to change the present. Thank you. That was brilliant, Kate. Thank you so, so much for that. Um, uh, okay, so now we have about 20 uh, to 25 minutes for um, questions and contributions. Um, so uh, I think we're going to just um, uh, raise your hand or you can um, put something in the chat and, and I'll take your questions. Okay, so um, I won't necessarily take these in order, um, but I will take um, Tom Griffiths and then Ben Stevenson. Thanks so much, Faisy. Brilliant, brilliant uh, introductions from absolutely everybody. And I especially enjoyed all the cultural uh, elements from Michael. Uh, a note that he didn't know um, Peter Watkins is a four and four hours and uh, 45 minute long film uh, about the commune. Um, I've not been brave enough to watch it. I wonder if other comrades have. Um, and I've also got that this graphic novel that um, Clara mentioned and still haven't got around to reading it. So that was all brilliant. Uh, there's a danger. My question is, isn't there with talking about the commune because it's so... Um, was so bloodily, ruthlessly, um, categorically ground into the dirt as it, uh, you know, in the, in the bloody repression. Um, how do we talk about the Paris Commune and all the ways which we are inspired by it in culture and our political work as, and, you know, going back to Marx's brilliant stuff. How do we, how do we balance that up? If we're trying to show this as a model, how do we bypass the kind of bloody truth of, uh, of how it wrapped up? Excellent, thanks, uh, Tom. Um, yeah, and just to say, keep your contributions to yeah, roughly roughly two minutes each. Uh, ben Stevenson. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks for that. Those were brilliant contributions. I just have to say, um, it was particularly interesting hearing about uh, Louise Michelle. She was a, a brilliant comrade and a true inspiration. I just wanted to ask because obviously. The, as, as Tom said, the history of the Paris Commune is obviously quite bloody um, and obviously it ended quite quickly. Um, so I'm just wondering what the panel thought some of the lessons are, um, particularly in terms of um, the battle for democracy and the battle for socialism and how those go hand in hand and how we can progress them in the 21st century. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, we'll hear now from Chris Nynum and then uh, Mark Porciani. <clears throat> Damn it, I wanted to talk about, I wanted to mention the Peter Watkins film, but I'm going to anyway, because I have seen it. And it's actually five hours, 45 minutes, not four hours, 45 minutes. But funnily enough, if you've got a hand, a spare six hours, it is worth taking a look at um, for various reasons. Um, but the main thing I just wanted to um, raise was something that I think is um, a little bit relevant to what's going on at the moment, which is that as well as kind of um, confirming Marx's prediction that working class democracy involved, like Kate was saying, um, overcoming the kind of separation between politics and economics. Another thing, another kind of uh, prediction, I think the commune uh, confirmed uh, was this idea that's so central to Marx that it's in the process of changing the world that people change themselves. Because there's some fantastic passages in the civil war in France about you know, what life was like under the commune and how it really transformed not just the politics and the economics, but everyday life and behavior was actually transformed as Kate says in such a short time. I just want to quickly read. Um, 
it, a paragraph in on page 81, no more corpses at the morgue, no nocturnal burglaries, scarcely any robberies. In fact, for the first time since the days of February 1848, the streets of Paris were safe and that without police of any kind. And then he goes on to say, um, in their stead, the real women of Paris showed once again at the surface, heroic, noble, devoted, like the women of antiquity, working, thinking, fighting, bleeding Paris, almost forgetful in its incubation of a new society. In other words, that, you know, in the process of the kind of political transformation, every the, the way people were behaving was 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 massively different. And and it kind of just that passage points to the way in which so many of the problems of everyday life actually find their roots in the kind of economic and social structures and that once those structures are challenged democratically from below in a very very short time those kind of some of those problems of everyday life at least are um are to some extent challenged and i just think there's all sorts of lessons for that today Thanks, Chris. That's that's beautiful. And people are posting um, links to Peter Watkins' films in, <laughs> film in the uh, in the chat <laughs> in case you have an extra six hours on your hands. Um, Mark uh, Porgiani, and then we'll hear from uh, Norbert Laurie. And I would also encourage once again um, women to uh, raise their hand and make contributions. Um, so, Mark. Hi. Can you see me? Okay, comrades. Hello. Great. Good. Uh, just a couple of quick. Um, uh, I'm glad. Um, I'm glad there's a new copy of Pilgrim, um, Pilgrims of Hope coming out. I spent all morning try, uh, trying to find my copy, and then realised I'd actually given it to an ex-girlfriend during Occupy. So I'm glad that I can, I can be able to replace that. I was just wondering if Michael Rosen would comment on on Zola's contributions to uh, his novels on the on the Paris Commune. Um, I'm just starting to read La Debacle, and was just wondering if he's got any thoughts on on what Zola what Zola said. Uh, on it. And then I just wanted to. I'm glad Kate came in and the connections kind of with kind of the kind of with Corbyn, with Jeremy Corbyn, and how we don't sit back as revel as revolutions. Because I've kind of felt that the, the two big electoral projects that I've been involved in the last decade, but whether it be for Scottish independence or for Jeremy Corbyn, is an element of this kind of returning to accepting that we need to weather away the state as well as as well as revolutionary smash up at the same time. And I was wondering if Kate would want to come in on that. And also, what about Engels' contribution to the to the Paris Commune? He, he wrote over 90 articles for the Palmar Gazette, and I recommend comrades to read the, 26 vol the 22nd volume of Marx's Complete Works, as it's all, all, all the correspondence together. Thanks, comrades. Thanks, uh, Mark. Um, so we'll hear from Norbert and then uh, Montana. Um, okay, am I... Norbert, we can't hear you. You need to unmute. Can you hear me now? Oh, thank you. Right. Um, fantastic lineup of speak speakers. Thoroughly enjoyed everything that everyone said. I particularly was interested in what um, John's contribution about working class people in Paris. And thinking about it and reading about things over the last couple of days, you know, 150 years is not really a long period in time. It's a short period in time. When you think that 43 years later, people were fighting in the fields of France and one of the bloodiest wars ever going, the First World War. I was particularly interested to learn about what in 72 years, what they were able to achieve. They suspended um, evictions. Um, Norbert, we're we're the factories. The Norbert, Norbert, we're having trouble here. Norbert, I just wondered if you could. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Right, um, your question. Yeah, I'm gonna reset. Great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so we'll next hear from Montana, and then I've got a question um, from from uh, 
the, the yeah from the chat and then we'll take Isabel Montana. Hi. Um, so I recently read um, this book, Communal Luxury by Kristen Ross. And um, one of the things that kind of surprised me that I had never known about the Paris Commune was uh, that there were kind of these intellectual clubs that were meeting way before even the war started. Um, and they were talking about very revolutionary ideas. Um, and so uh, I think that what the argument she makes is that that led to um, the, the, the actual like coming together of, of uh, like taking over this, this government that, that fled. Um, and uh, I see like maybe a more modern uh, version of these intellectual clubs is maybe groups on social media. And I have seen a number of times where we have a general strike trending on Twitter but it doesn't really lead to anything and it almost um, dissipates the, the kind of like revolutionary spirit that is drummed up. And so I wonder, um, and, and, and it also kind of, part of it encourages hopelessness, I think, because we're not meeting in person. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I wonder what, um, like how do we combat that kind of uh, hopelessness and um, uh, the dissipation of revolutionary spirit through social media? Excellent question. Thanks, Montana. Um, and so we've got a question from um, Colin Dark, who's, who has a question for John Westmoreland. You talked about Houseman. Is it correct to consider the width of the new avenues work that was a strategy to hamper the building of barricades? And if so, did this play a part in, um, in the violence? Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's a question. And uh, so then we'll take uh, Isabel and then Jonas McConey. Hi, thanks, Daisy. Um, fantastic contributions, such a great event. Um, I just wondered if anybody wanted to come back on how we can situate the lessons of the commune in the kind of 19th and 20th century continuum of revolutionary activity. So how the lessons of the commune fed into Lenin, fed into the Russian revolutions, both of them. And then we look again at how that perhaps went downhill much later over a much longer period of time with Stalinism. What do we learn from that? And always remember third time lucky. So I just wondered if anybody wanted to come in and say a bit more about that, the whole kind of 200 year history of revolutionary activity and what we can learn from every event and how that builds. Excellent question. Um, uh, Jonas. Hi comrades and thanks very much to all the speakers uh, for those really excellent introductions. Um, and I think it's really interesting to talk about the commune today because I think we got to a point where there's even some sections on the left where there's a lot of sort of contempt towards working class people and the ideas of working class people and this sort of idea that working class people are so inherently, inherently sort of reactionary that they can't be a kind of progressive force. And I think it's interesting to speak about the, the commune and the sort of internationalism of the commune and how it's censored uh, working class women and things like that to show that really, and also uh, I, I was reading Marx's uh, Civil War in France, my homework for this session, and where he talks about sort of how the landlords were trying to set up a reactionary government um, to basically impose stability back in France and how what, he's, what they saw was that the biggest obstacle to setting up that government was the armed working and organized working class of Paris. Um, I think that's just sort of an interesting principle for us to sort of, uh, to kind of apply today to see that the kind of way that we can overcome these kind of reactionary uh, ideologies is through organizing working class people in defense of their own interests and sort of giving working class people the capacity to fight for their own interests. And if you get to that point, then it becomes very difficult to dupe people with these kind of reactionary ideas that the ruling class imposes on us. Um, in order to basically kind of keep us down, I guess. But yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, just before I take um, Elaine and then Mark, um, there's a question from Carol A. I've been thinking about when the population in the UK will rise against the injustices we are experiencing to the extent that our society really does change. Will we need to be even poorer that many, that many are now with 50% of women joining street workers um, or prostitutes uh, in order to feed themselves and or their families? What will it take, do you think? So that's a question for, for the panel. Uh, so Elaine and then Mark Smith. 
Thanks, Faisy. Um, so this is a, a question, I think, for, for John. Um, so thinking about the um, the, the reasons why, obviously, the, the, the commune was defeated and that, and that point, really, that because they weren't able to, to, to spread it to, to other towns and in the end it becomes isolated. So in many ways, this is kind of a, an illustration, I think, isn't it, that in the same way that you can't have sustainable socialism in one country, you actually can't have socialism in one city either. Um, and I wondered how much that is... Uh, there's that difficulty there is is kind of a product of the sort of the history of communes in in France that in a way you know there's a reason isn't there that this happens in Paris and not in Berlin or Frankfurt or London because there is this tradition that has been the case for you know many hundreds of years of French towns setting up communes as a way of defending themselves against aristocratic power and the feudal feudal system so there's this model there that the Paris communards have have available to them so, you know, they're learning from their history, but not in the circumstances that they would choose, because also that model is very, very isolating. And there's, um, you know, in some medieval periods, this is, uh, I always bring in the medieval period because it's always relevant. But this is stuff that, that, that I work on. And they do try to, um, you know, to when you have these communes, they do try to work with other towns. But the thing is, because you have these very survivalist relationships between French communes, it's actually never really possible to do that. And I wondered if John had any thoughts of the extent to which they're in a sense they're sort of trapped in their history and that makes it maybe more difficult to generalize the lessons um in a way that presumably they would have uh, they would have wanted to so uh, yeah sorry that wasn't uh, the most coherent question but anyway that's it thanks elaine that's great um so mark smith and then uh, we'll hear from claire Solomon. hi comrades can you hear me um, right, I just I, I wasn't expecting to do this, but I do feel compelled to say something about the Peter Watkins film because I've spent the last three days watching that, and I'd I'd be very upset if if comrades thought that it was somehow inaccessible or an obscure thing to watch. I mean, it is seven hours long, but I think if people think of it as a seven hour mini series, I think it's quite approachable, and the kind of drama documentary form that it used that was avant-garde 20 years ago, the fake drama documentary is part of the TV mainstream now. So I really would recommend watching it. But the thing is, is once you start watching it, is you've met all those characters before. All those characters in the, in the commune, you've seen in a strike committee meeting, in a stop the war organizing meeting, in any kind of campaign meeting where revolutionaries and reformists have come together to discuss tactics and strategies and advancing the movement forward. It seems to me that all those questions that arose arise every time were there in, in, in the commune, in the first kind of um, the first kind of workers government. So I really would recommend giving it a view. <clears throat> Following on from that, and I've been reflecting on thinking about the commune, not about the past two or three days, and it is just so so ripe with lessons and things that I think are very meaningful today. But the thing that really struck me more than anything is you have these group of workers who are, are absolutely desperate immiseration. They really are in an absolutely terrible sort of situation, but they still seize the opportunity to take the movement forward. They still see that there's an opportunity for our side in these terrible, terrible conditions. And I just wonder, you know, I look around today and I see very little optimism of opportunity on our side. I think a lot of our side thinks that best that we can ever hope for now in a post-COVID environment is a kind of return to business as usual. But we have to understand that the fault lines that the ruling class present to us in the same way that were presented to the communards at the end of the Franco-Prussian War, we are now going to see before us uh, in a post-COVID period, in a post-2007 period, and we really have to be a lot more optimistic and think of the communards and the sacrifices and the absolutely really innovative progressive thinking everything was outside of the box in the commune i mean one of the things i you know there was one of the things that they did was they had the they wanted to spread the message to the provinces so they used balloons to kind of get these leaflets in which they said to the the peasants in the agriculture the peasants in in the countryside you hey guys we're on the same side as you what you want we want and they use a balloon to distribute all these leaflets i mean that was the information superhighway in 2000, in 1817, I just think 
it's fantastic. But my question to the panel is, is um, do, do they think that that level of miseration is required for workers to take the kind of leaps that the communards did? Thanks, Mark. OK, that's a, that's a similar question to what's been asked. So that's great. Um, so Claire and then Martin Hall. Thank you to everybody and um, the wonderful contributions at the beginning. It's particularly lovely to hear about the women of the Paris Commune. So thank you, Clara, for your wonderful um, summary of that, that um, inspiring woman and the and the women that were involved. Um, I started making a bit of a kind of personal documentary about this many years ago, and I've always been inspired and fascinated by the relationship between people's confidence and their political activity. I've always really um, found had a really vivid image of the women at the top of the hill, standing in front of the cannons and then running down the hill, banging on their pots, getting everybody out of their houses to get involved in occupying the whole of Paris. I just thought that was such an amazing kind of visual. And then, of course, they went on to, to conduct and organise organize and conduct big political meetings in the churches of Paris and all of those you know are lovely images of them standing at the top of those pulpits not delivering religious sermons but you know rabble rousing speeches to the women of Paris and I think you know much like the women of the four Dagenham factories much like the suffragettes when we are involved in something politically um, our confidence levels go through the roof that um, relationship between trying to work out what's going on, trying to um, democratically discuss and debate and, and agree on what we should be doing um, really helps us educates ourselves, if you like, and clarify our political thoughts and makes us into much stronger people. So, you know, obviously I'm going to encourage everybody here to get involved in something if they're not already. Um, I do have a little question, Clara, if that's OK. Um, I'm always, um, I don't quite know, I don't know a lot about it, but the real, um, with um, Michelle, what was her first name? Um, completely gone Louise, Louise Michelle um, being an anarchist what was the relationship between her and other political groupings within the um, Paris Commune what are you know how did they get on the revolutionaries the socialists the liberals the anarchists and so on I'd be really interested to hear some stories about those um, kind of shenanigans or whatever negotiations I think thank right. you everybody thanks, thanks Claire um, and just a reminder, people can uh, just raise their hand or put their question in the chat. We've got a few minutes um, for, for before I bring back the, um, the, the contributors. Uh, so Martin Hall. Uh, thanks, Faisy. Um, <clears throat> before I uh, make my contribution, just wanted to second what Mark said and other people have said in the chat about the Peter Watkins film. It is really worth watching. It may seem long, but, it, but it's absolutely worth your time. And it, as indeed are most of his films. So someone I'd, I'd recommend as a film director, just to digress briefly. Coming back to obviously the topic um, and slightly getting ahead of myself into the second session here, really, but it's just something I was thinking about. Um, some of you may have seen there's been BBC, it was a BBC article this week about the commune. In fact, John Westmoreland sent it to a number of us. And um, being a BBC article, of course, it attempts to be even handed. And of course, being even handed really means it gives a lot of space to lots of right wing people in France to talk about how awful the communards, communards were and so on and so forth. And it's got me thinking about a how we memorialize history and why events like this are important. Because obviously, by definition, there are always these kind of, you know, supposedly uh, even handed histories that in reality give a lot of space to people um, who most most ordinary people, I think, would not have anything in common with. I mean, and it's interesting when this happens, because, of course, people don't do that with World War Two. People don't in the main try and talk about all oh, those Nazis weren't too bad or whatever, you know. But when it's something like the commune, people are quite comfortable giving space to kind of the political right. And it got me thinking really about the current situation in which we find ourselves, where we've got obviously kind of, you know, we've got lots of very good protests on the left happening at the moment, particularly uh, against, uh, against violence against women. But also, of course, as people have seen on Saturday, anti-lockdown protests and all sorts of manner of, you know, what Gramsci might call morbid symptoms coming into play at the moment. And, and quite a high chance, I would say, of civil unrest of various types in this country this summer. Hence, of course, the Tories' attempt to try and get the police bill through, which is currently on the back burner briefly. I'm just wondering what, if the panellists want to say anything. As I say, I'm slightly getting into the second session here about um, 
about, I suppose, essentially our current situation and what and how it, it, at a time when the Labour leadership has left the field of battle, how the left might organise, uh, you know, in, with the Paris Commune as our inspiration. I'm not saying we're going to be in a revolutionary situation this summer. We're clearly not. But just really what lessons we might draw. Thanks a lot, Martin. Um, any more questions, contributions from the floor? We have a few minutes. I can take one or two. Um, Lyndon. Or CZ, I don't know who. who, who. Yeah, no, it's it's me. I'll I'll be really really quick. Um, I'm not going to talk about the Peter Watkins film. Uh, uh, you know, just to say that being a shift worker it took me about 72 days to complete it. Um, the the thing is, I, I'm this has been a great event actually because you know George Orwell, who uh, famously said, you know, uh, 1984. How does he say? It? Those who control the present, uh, present uh, control the past. Those who control the past control the future. And this event, of course, really re-establishes what happened in the commune and its significance uh, today. Just two things, being a rail worker, um, Clara mentioned Louise Mitchell being uh, the, the only woman named after a train station in, in, uh, in, in, in Paris. It's quite interesting because it relates to what Lenin said in State and the Revolution, of course, in their lifetimes, these people are hounded by the rulers, uh, the ruling class, and etc. And of course, once they're dead, they they become icons, and 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 their revolutionary message kind of uh, diminished an attempt to diminish that revolutionary message. So it's it's, it's really quite fits in, into into that kind of uh, bracket. The other railway um, uh, thing for me is, of course. The person who wrote the the great song of the Paris Commune, the Internationale, which hopefully Michael can come back on it, was someone who also fought for half price uh, tickets on the railways for the poor. Um, but that song, of, of course, written by Eugene Potier, was also an international song because the 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 uh, the music to it was written by a Belgian after his death, uh, and of course the, the Commune itself in terms of those who led it, were Hungarian, Poles and etc. So a true sense of internationalism. And so if Michael can come back on, on, on the great song of the Paris Commune. Thank you, Anjum. Okay, so we'll um, hear from the speakers now who will sum up for uh, about five minutes each and we'll go in the same order. So um, John and then um, Kalara and then Michael and, uh, and Kate. So John. Thank you and thanks everybody for a, for a fantastic discussion. Um, <clears throat> I'm only going to I'm going to select a, a few of the things that I need to, to concentrate on. Um, and the first one is about the you know the, the problem of the bloodiness of the commune and its suppression and isn't it a sort of a recipe for turning people off revolution and, and my response to that is to say why not take a step backwards. Um, the Marx and Engels predicted that uh, a victory for Prussia in the Franco-Prussian war would lead to a war against Germandom, against Slavdom. So when we're talking about violence, that's a pretty good place to start. Um, Bismarck united Germany under Prussian arms. That increased imperialist tensions within Europe and that was exported into Africa British war in Sudan, Boer war for diamonds, Zulu war, the war of, in French Algeria, um, and of course the German massacres of the Herero people in Africa. So the body count in Africa is pretty bloody. And then of course that leads up to an intensified racism where Jews in particular bore the brunt of coming up to the First World War. And then you get all the imperialist bloodbath of the First World War. The commune tried to disrupt that logic and that process with its internationalism, with its, its uh, you know, its government for ordinary people, its challenging of authority, its attempt to put power, real power down into the working class. The, the commune stood against that violence. So in terms of the weighing up the bodies, which is a grisly way to put it, you know, the argument is on our side. 
And yeah, it is true that Houseman, uh, in response to uh, one comrade who asked about, about the barricade, was it the boulevards were wide enough to stop barricade building and to allow a shot of cannon down onto barricades uh, it should they form. But I don't know if you've seen the photographs, the Parisians weren't to be beaten on the barricades front. And if you look at some of the barricades, they're up to first floor level right across the boulevard. So Houseman's work, um, you know, didn't, didn't pay off. Um, you, you know, and, and I mean, one thing about it, it, it wasn't just the immiseration, you know, that caused the revolution. It was this, they obviously, people knew they were being duped. Houseman did his modernization of Paris with some grotesque financial swindling. Uh, and, and of course, the Parisians knew about that. Now, in the minute or so I've got left, I just want to quickly refer to what I Elaine said. Um, of course, Paris, a city in revolution at the end of a war, was a first of many in modern capitalist history, St. Petersburg and Berlin. And, you know, the message of, of the commune went to St. Petersburg, that workers, you know, when they invented Soviets, workers can, are inventive, workers are leading the fight, they, they know how to put up uh, structures to defend their own interests and take the fight to the enemy. But you absolutely right about, to an extent, the commune was trapped in its own history. You know that, I mean, De La Cluse was a marvellous individual who died on the barricades voluntarily. Uh, but, you know, I mean, what did he spend his time in the, comrade do, in the commune doing? He was rewriting the revolutionary calendar of 1792. I mean, was his time best spent doing that? You know, and lots of people, who Marx called them ballers, they turn up and they said, ah, you know, you communards, you need to look back at this date and that date and this sect and that sect. And, and basically they went there to advertise their wares and they, they were a distraction to the organization of the commune and Marx gave them short shrift and said good riddance to the lot of them, they should uh, bugger off. You know, I mean, Bakunin in particular, I mean, the funny thing is that he went out to denounce the authorities of the state on the steps of the Lyon town hall, didn't he? He only got the words out of his mouth and he got arrested. So, you know, I mean, the idea of, you know, a few brave people, you know, taking over the state, the working class saw through that in practice and that they did something completely different. I just want to finish off with one thing that answers a lot of questions about leadership and about idealism and everything else. On the 7th of April, crucial date really, when the troops are narrowing in on Paris, a group of women called a street demonstration on Boulevard Richard Lenoir. Uh, and the subject was how do we mo mobilize people in the fight to get them on the barricades? You know, to, And they said, there's no turning back. There can't be any surrender. We have to sacrifice everything because we're going to get crushed anyway. And these women proposed, they said to the commune, we aren't doing this to disrespect you. We want to give the men an inspiration. They shouldn't be hiding in their homes. They need to be out on the barricades with us. And what they proposed was that they would organize a column of 700 women armed, marching behind a red flag. They were going to march on Versailles and take down Thiers' government. Now, it didn't happen. But, you know, I guarantee that if Marx, Trotsky or any other great revolutionary tactician was on the streets, they would say that is the leadership which should be at the front of the commune. We need to take the fight to the enemy. We need to organise and take it seriously because we're only going to get one bite at the cherry. That's amazing. Thank you, John, for that. Um, really brilliant. Um, so next we'll hear from Clara. Sum up. Um, can Tom or Shabir? Yes, I'm unmuted. <laughs> um, I think this, I think I have three things that I'd like to say. Um, one is that I think there's a real tension in discussions of someone like Louise Michel about how far you go with celebrating revolutionary figures and to what extent in celebrating them, you're also forgetting the work of masses, right? The work of like the huge amount of people who supported them. Um, and in celebrating Louise Michel, both as a, both in these sanitized 
um, celebrations, of which there are many. I mean, if you look her up on Wikipedia, it says um, Louise Michel was a revolution, uh, was a teacher and participant in the Paris Commune. So the fact that she's a teacher comes first, and she was a teacher, but she was also the rev her revolutionary um, beliefs came before her teaching. They infused everything that she did, and the same with more radical memories of her, in which she's often cast as. Um, this figure, La, La Vierge Rouge, the Red Virgin, she's viewed as kind of mythical. Um, and I think there's a real danger here in separating her from the sort of structures that she was challenging and the ways in which she was acting on behalf of a collective and as part of a collective. Um, so I'm kind of wary of that, even though I know I'm also contributing to that in celebrating her. Um, in terms of how she got on with socialists, um, she wasn't actually a sort of, um, a wouldn't have identified as an anarchist at the time of the commune. It wasn't until she was on the boat to New Caledonia at the end of the commune and she uh, met a person called Natalie Lamel, um, who taught her about anarchism. And that was the point in which she really became involved in it. But I think that also at the time of the commune, there was a far more fluid, um, or maybe not at the time, but during the commune, there was a pretty fluid interaction between different left-wing groups. Um, and the uh, rigid rigidity with which others outside of the commune or historicizing it might um, determine who was what kind of uh, revolutionary was not necessarily apparent to them at that time. Um, and I think actually, to bring this back to the discussion of Kristen Ross, that's one of the things that she theorizes so beautifully in that book, this idea that these people were, were living on a, a lot of the radicalism of the commune was lived out on an extremely mundane level. Um, and maybe to sort of end on that as, as one of the things that we can take from the commune as a historical example, I think, that there's so much to be said for the commune as an example of people going onto the streets and being visible. Um, and women who lived incredibly sequestered lives just taking up their place in the public sphere. Um, and the same with, you know, with actually working class men as well, just taking up a space on the streets and existing in these places and occupying that place. Um, and so I think that's definitely a lesson that we can that we can learn from the commune and have learned from the commune to some extent and have to, especially um, in relation to what's going on in the UK at the moment with the policing bill, have to keep on learning and keep on uh, taking up that space. I think that's all I have to say. That's brilliant, Clara. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so we'll now hear from Michael. Uh, hi there. Um, as I said in the chat room, I'd forgot to say bon anniversaire at the beginning, which is, you know, happy anniversary to everybody. I hope that that's what they're saying in France at the moment. Uh, I'll just take up three things. I'll be very, very quick. Zola, uh, guilty as charged. Uh, terribly sorry. Uh, I haven't read the Zola novels where he refer where which are set in the commune. So I, I complete ignorance there. I'm not going to pretend to be clever on that. Um, Zola is a fascinating figure in a variety of ways. Um, you know, he, he was seen by others as a migrant. Uh, people used a racist word towards him. They called him Metek, which is a, a, a sneer, is worse. It's a racial slur towards him because they saw him as Italian. His father's name was Zola. Um, and uh, so this was used against him when he took up more and more radical positions. Um, it, it, he's a very interesting bloke. I don't know exactly what he wrote about the commune. The stuff I know about in great detail is to do with the Dreyfus case, where he really put his neck on the line in support of a very un, unpopular uh, cause at the time of Dreyfus uh, being sentenced to effective death by being sent to Devil's Island, so-called, um, for a trumped-up charge uh, of treason. Um, and Zola defended him. Um, on the grounds of the bourgeois values, if you like, of the French Revolution. So he was somebody who, by adhering to liberty, equality, fraternity, freedom, justice, democracy, he actually challenged the way the bourgeoisie at that particular moment was lining itself up against Jews in general in order to secure its power. And he saw through that 
it's quite very interesting that he did and wrote an essay called Pour les Juifs, for the Jews, and was very influenced by, and we're talking about anarchists, by an anarchist called Bernard Lazare. And so you can look up some of that stuff. Hausmann, I was just made the point that um, uh, David Harvey, who you, many of you will be familiar with, has written about Hausmann. And as I said in the chat, um, David Harvey makes the point that obviously we see class war as around the point of production, um, but, House, but David Harvey wants to make out, wants to make the point that somebody like Hausmann shows us that in actual fact, class war can also go on in space. In other words, where we live, where and how we live. And Harvey is making the point that all those things that John made, all made all those points, but actually first, before they built the boulevards, they, they forcibly cleared out that those quarters of Paris, which you'd never know to, these day, to this day, if you go down the boulevards of Boulevard Lafayette and so on, you wouldn't know that these were working class areas right in the center of Paris. And they were literally bulldozed in order to build the boulevard. So this was a very early example of, in quotes, regeneration, which we know has gone on in most of the cities of this country, in the States and all over the world. The degeneration that takes place deliberately first, and then in come the developers, often hand in league with the local councils to regenerate. And Harvey has written about that. And that's in a sense, it was foretold by what happened with Hausmann. So that's not to take anything away from what John said. And then Potier, um, uh, I, I didn't do Potier partly because the, the, the poem is obviously the poem as it was, the Internationale, uh, very well known to all of us. Um, Potier, interestingly enough, which I didn't quite realise, um, actually went into exile after being in the commune um, and having written the Internationale as a poem and as we heard was set to music and then came back to Paris and, and then uh, died penniless. But he also wrote another little poem, uh, some of which goes, On l'a tué à coups de chasse à coups de mitrailleuse, et roulé avec son drapeau dans la terre argileuse. Et la tourbe des bourreaux grasse croyait la plus forte. Tout ça n'empêche pas, Nicolas, que la commune n'est pas morte. Translated as, they killed her with their chasse with their machine guns, and rolled her with its flags in the clay. And the mud of the fat hangmen thought they had prevailed. And with all that, Nicolas, the commune is not dead. Que la commune n'est pas morte. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Um, and finally, we'll hear from Kate. Oh, thanks so much, everyone. That was a really inspiring discussion. Um, I'm I'm going to kind of talk about two things, I hope, in my summing up. Um, one is this question of, of immiseration and what generates revolutions. We've talked a little bit about um, Lenin writing about the commune, um, and August Nimtz is going to be talking in, in our next session um, in detail about Lenin and the commune. But one thing that he said about revolutions is that they're made not, not by people sort of accumulating more and more suffering but when people when when the ruling class can no longer rule in the old way but when everybody else will no longer be ruled in the old way and i think that's very important to in terms of understanding what happens in in paris you know when marx was looking at the paris commune he he wrote to his friend uh, dr kugelman and he said accidents will will happen in history um you know this wasn't something that was pre-planned but also, you know, was the famine in 1871 in, in Paris, you know, it was awful, people were starving, but was that worse than what was happening in Ireland um, in the middle of the 19th century? Was what they were facing worse than um, the restoration of the royalists at the beginning of, of the 19th century? No, I think we have to understand what happened in 1871 as part of a, a part of a process of radicalization and growing confidence. This comes off the back of the National Guard, for example, organizing amongst themselves and starting to create a new structure where they elect their own representatives, which gives them more confidence and gives people the confidence that actually we could run things a lot better in this city if we were doing it ourselves. And it's off the back of that and people, more and more people drawing that conclusion um, that, um, that the Paris Commune appears. And I think that's why it's important for us to remember that everything that strengthens our side, that gives working class people more confidence, that advances our interests against capitalist interests, these are important things for us to, to fight for in the here and now. Um, 
And it's also why, conversely, on the other side, we're encouraged to do things that, that deny those separate interests in society. It's why we're encouraged to do things like wave a national flag, to believe in stuff like national unity and that there is a, a national interest because, it's, because it blunts that, that understanding. But I think that also explains for us why the end of the commune was so bloody. And just to kind of um, talk about that and maybe to respond a bit to what, what Isabel was asking about where this fits historically. Um, Rosa Luxemburg, a great revolutionary um, who was murdered um, in, in Germany in 1919, her last article that she wrote was titled Order Reigns in Berlin. And that title was taken from Karl Marx. It was taken from Marx writing um, about another massacre on the streets of Paris of working class people in June 1848. And in this article, Rosa Luxemburg, who knew that she was going to be murdered, she knew that this uprising that she'd been a part of uh, was being defeated. She talked about why the repression was so bloody and she put what they were doing um, in Germany in 1919 um, in its historical context, she compared them to the communards, she compared them to those people that had been massacred in, in June 1848. And why she did that was she said that what the, all of these uprisings had in common was they were working class uprisings. They weren't uprisings that could be co-opted or could suddenly become compatible in some way with the established order. They represented an existential threat and so therefore for the establishment they had to be absolutely wiped out and decimated in the most brutal fashion possible and we have to we have to understand that. We can't deny that. We have to talk about Bloody Week when we think um, about the Paris Commune but I think for this reason, that we need to understand um, the mistakes that were made. You know, one thing that Marx said about the communards was if they made a mistake, it's that they were too cautious. They didn't do things like, you know, as, as John was saying in, in his opening speech, like march on the reactionary government. Um, you know, they were naive in, in some respects. They didn't do things like, like seize the Bank of, of France. And this was such an important um, lesson for revolutionaries afterwards about the need to generalize and expand those revolutions, not to think that capitalist society would let this go unnoticed precisely because of the inspiration that it could represent. Um, and therefore it means for us that, that socialism needs to be international, it needs to spread, we need to inspire um, other people. Um, but that is an explanation as I think to to why the death toll is, is so high. But for our side, I think it means that ideas are really important. It's really important for us to know what we're up against. It's why the Paris Commune took the struggle for ideas so very seriously. It was why um, getting a good education was so much a part of why people um, took to the streets, why they wanted education, wrested away from reactionaries and, and the clergy um, and so on and, and so forth. It's because those ideas could be incredibly powerful. So I think it's important for us to be very clear um, about what it is we're fighting for, what it is that we're up against so that, that next time we can win. Thank you so much, Kate. That's excellent. It's been such a fantastic and inspiring first session. And thanks so much to all our brilliant speakers. Um, I just wanted to, before we um, have a break for 15 minutes uh, and we reconvene at three, just remind people um, that that um, uh, session on uh, women's oppression and its roots in class society will be uh, this coming Saturday, the 27th, uh, with Elaine Graham Lee, um, and that will be at 2 p.m. Uh, that's part of a, a series of Marxist forums that Counterfire is organizing um, on women's oppression. and. Uh, also, just to say that uh, the People's Assembly Against Austerity is um, organizing a national demonstration on the 26th of June, so put that in your diaries, um, and you can check out uh, a number of articles that Counterfire has written on the Commune. Um, over the past few weeks, we've been posting them. Counterfire uh, is an organization, it stands in the tradition of uh, the Commune and socialism from below, and you can... Um, also find um, a news from the front line bulletin that we produce every uh, every Friday, industrial news, features, socialist theory, and so on, including the events that we organize. And you can also find out uh, more about how to join the organization if you're, um, if you're interested in that. So 
will reconvene for the second session at 3 p.m. Um, and we're having August Nymphs, Lindsay German, Daniela Bono, and Shabir Laka uh, to speak. So thanks everyone, and we'll see you in 15 minutes.
Okay, welcome back, comrades. We'll be uh, starting again shortly. We'll just give people a minute, as I can see lots of videos are still off, so I'm guessing people are still getting themselves comfortable for part two, which will start in about 60 seconds or so. Okay, I think we can make a start now. Um, with the wonders of Zoom, uh, chairing has moved 200 miles north, now in Manchester rather than in London, so a truly international event, obviously. And um, I do want to say something about the second panel before I say something about the speakers. Um, it's called, as you'll have seen, Changing the World After the Commune. And when we were putting this event together, we all knew, I think, how important it was to actually do this session as well as the first one, to not treat the Commune as something from history just you know, set in aspic, kind of, in the way that perhaps certain types of historical societies, nothing wrong with that, don't get me wrong, might look at it, but we obviously want to look at it in terms of how, what it can tell us about our political practice now, and indeed what it told various people between then, 150 years ago, and now. Um, many of you uh, may have come to the commune, indeed, from reading Lenin, and specifically, of course, State and Revolution, and our first speaker will, I'm sure, say something about that shortly, more of that in a minute. We're going to have four speakers again, so exactly the same uh, setup as before. Each of them will speak for 10 to 12 minutes, and this is to the speakers. If you get to 12 minutes and you don't seem to be concluding, I will come in and politely and comradely ask you to, in a comradely fashion, I should say. Um, the four speakers, I'll introduce them as, as but one at a time, but just at the beginning to say who they are. I've got August Nimtz, Lindsay German, Daniela Bono, and Shabir Lakar. We'll then have time for questions again, and then we'll reconvene the panel at about 25 past. That's, of course, 25 past four. Um, the idea is to finish at quarter to five, but obviously we do have till five o'clock. So if there are many more hands up than we had before, we can go on a little bit longer if needs be. Right, please. I'm going to introduce now our first speaker, which is August, who is August Nimtz. August is Professor of Political Science and African-American and African Studies at the University of Minnesota. And he's written rather a lot of stuff, but specifically for our purposes, I thought the one, the, the, the two volume <coughs> work on uh, Lenin's electoral strategy uh, up to 1907, then from 1907 to the October Revolution was perhaps the one I wanted to mention. So I'm going to hand over to you now, August, We've got to 10 to 12 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Morton. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I want to thank uh, Connifier for inviting me uh, to be a part of the uh, program. I'm always pleased to be a part of any discussion about the, uh, uh, the, Paris, uh, the Paris Commune. And I thought I'd preface my comments about uh, uh, Lenin and the Russian Revolution uh, with a few comments about another uh, place in the world uh, that the Paris Commune had a major impact on. I'm referring to the United States and I'm referring to the overthrow of Reconstruction. As people know, the uh, Civil War was the most important democratic breakthrough uh, in the uh, 19th century. And uh, it's no accident that, uh, uh, that Marx uh, titled his analysis of the Paris Commune, the Civil War, uh, in France, uh, exactly because the Civil War in the United States had been very much uh, on his brain. Uh, Marx dropped everything, including the writing and research for capital, uh, in order to spend time figuring out, uh, making sense, and politically intervening uh, in London um, to defend uh, Lincoln and the, uh, the cause of the, of the Union. After the victory, the overthrow of the slaveocracy, there was a moment in uh, US history known as Reconstruction, 
where the former slaves were able to uh, obtain political rights for the first time, including the right to, to vote. Uh, revolutionary governments were established in the former, in the former uh, slave, uh, slave states in the, in the Confederacy. Uh, revolutionary governments composed of not only the former slaves, but also uh, working class, poor whites uh, in, the, uh, in the South. But um, the, um, uh, that alliance, that alliance, alliance uh, frightened the ruling class and the liberal wing of the Republican Party, which had once been the, the Revolutionary Party. And the beginning of their fears uh, about Reconstruction uh, begins with Paris, the Paris Commune. Um, the fear on their part that what happened in Paris uh, would spread to the United States. And there's a very, very excellent book by the historian uh, Heather Cox Richardson. I encourage people uh, to look for Richardson's book. She, she provides convincing detail on how the coverage of the commune, the editorials, the news coverage in the United States, in the North and so on, all of that helps explain why it is that the ruling class, the liberal ruling class, uh, betrayed, betrayed the um, Reconstruction government. So by uh, 1876, 1877, uh, the beginning of the end of that brief experiment in racial equality uh, in the in the United States. And so the like the like the commune, uh, the revolutionary moment in the United States went down in a bloody in a bloody defeat. And uh, the fact that uh, uh, Paris, uh, the developments in Paris uh, uh, played an important role in understanding uh, why that happened is something I think we should also absorb and, and think about the significance, the significance of. Okay, Lenin and the, uh, and the Bolsheviks. I think as everybody knows, um, at the central question in the Russian Revolution, of course, is which class uh, would would prevail, and they, would it be the working class in alliance with the peasantry, or would it be the bourgeoisie, uh, the bourgeoisie itself? That was the that was the central issue in the revolution, and the proxy the proxy for that was which form of governance, which form of governance would prevail uh, in Russia? Would it be a parliamentary democracy, or would it be Soviet Soviet democracy? And Soviet democracy, I argue, uh, <clears throat> for Lenin, uh, was um, a form of democracy that had been previewed uh, in the Paris in the Paris uh, Commune. The developments in the Paris Commune were crucial in understanding why Lenin embraced uh, Soviet democracy when it appeared for the first time uh, on its own. Uh, uh, the uh, workers in Saint Petersburg. Uh, uh, developed this on and without the assistance of the Bolsheviks. And it took the Bolsheviks a while to actually, to begin embracing, embracing the Soviets, whether or not it had to do with the fact that Trotsky was a leader uh, of the, uh, of the uh, St. Petersburg Soviet uh, is up for, is up for debate. But, uh, and I argue though that Lenin, Lenin goes on a campaign to convince the Bolsheviks to embrace to embrace the uh, the Soviets, and the reason for that is because of the research, the prior research that Lenin had been doing on the Paris Commune, his first trip to uh, Europe in 1895, uh, visiting libraries uh, throughout Europe, he couldn't get enough, he couldn't read enough about the Paris uh, about the Paris uh, Commune, and that that um, uh, research. Um, information, I argue, was crucial in understanding why he saw the significance, the significance of the uh, of the Soviets when they spontaneously appeared uh, in 1905 uh, in uh, Saint in Saint Peters in St. Petersburg. And for Lenin, of course, the central lesson of the Paris Commune was the central lesson that Marx and Engels drew about about the Paris uh, Commune, and that is that the working class cannot make take hold of the ready-made state uh, for its own purposes. And in other words, the, to bring about socialist transformation, uh, a new state form would be required. And this is what, that was the, the central lesson for Marx and Engels of the Paris Commune. We always remember that 
the only correction that Marx and Engels ever made uh, to the Communist Manifesto is in the preface uh, in the 1872 edition uh, of, the, of the Communist Manifesto where they uh, take from the Civil War in France that central lesson that the working class cannot take uh, make whole of uh, take whole the uh, the ready the, the existing state structure in order to wield it for its own purposes. Lenin had solved that lesson to his bones, and because of that, because of that, he he understood that so well. This is why he was able to see the significance, the significance of the of the Soviets uh, uh, when they when they appeared uh, uh, spontaneously in about October of uh, 19, of 1905. Um, and again, his task was to convince the Bolsheviks who were on the scene that, no, 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 we, this is it. We, wanna, we don't wanna be sectarian and standoffish uh, uh, about the Soviets who want to, we want to em embrace. All right, so this, when the Soviets uh, would later appear, of course, spontaneously again in, 19, uh, in 1917, and Lenin was even more prepared uh, and more informed about the Paris uh, Commune. Uh, Kate mentioned uh, the Kugelman letters, extremely important uh, that uh, this is a friendly debate, civil debate that uh, Marx was having with what might be described as an armchair, an armchair communist, armchair radical, an acquaintance of uh, who was very judgmental uh, in the comfort of, uh, of his uh, in Germany um, and uh, critical, critical of the uh, of the Paris uh, of the Paris Commune, and um, those letters that Marx wrote about uh, um, um, the contingency of the revolutionary process is really, really important. I was in a debate on uh, when was it on the, or the historic date of uh, January six, uh, at the very moment that the Motley crew. Uh, was invading the capital. I was engaged in a, in a debate with a Marxist scholar who challenged uh, my claim that historical contingency goes a long way in explaining the Stalinist outcome uh, of the Russian Revolution. He challenged me to say, no, 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 no. Um, Marx and Engels, uh, that, uh, if you're talking about historical contingency, that does not sound like a Marxist like a Marxist idea. Well, read the Kogelman letters where Marx talks about uh, accidents, accidents uh, in history and chance. Uh, that's it, 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 crucial, crucial love. And I remember when I first read the Kugelman letter, I said to myself, boy, I, I bet when Lenin uh, reads them, uh, found these letters, he was really, really moved by them. That's exactly what happened. In 1913, uh, Lenin came across the, uh, uh, the Kugelman, uh, the Kugelman uh, letters. And uh, I'll just read an ex excerpt from Lenin's response when he read Marx's uh, critique uh, of uh, Kugelman's judgmental, uh, armchair judgmental approach to the Paris uh, Commune. And the question was um, leadership and the fact that yes, Marx had counseled uh, the communards, the future communards to hold off to revolutionary restraint. They didn't have a, a leadership uh, uh, in place. And, uh, and so Lenin says uh, then did, uh, did, uh, the question he raises, did Marx therefore take a standoffish attitude? Did he reign on the parade because they didn't uh, uh, abide by his, uh, his advice? And Lenin said, no. On April the 12th, 1871, Marx writes an enthusiastic letter to Kugelman, a letter which, and this is a letter which we would like to see hung in the home of every Russian social democrat and of every literate Russian worker. When we saw, when he saw the mass movement of the people, he watched it with the keen attention of a participant in great events, marking a step forward in the historic revolutionary movement. The historical initiative of the masses was what Marx prized above anything else. Marx knew how to warn the leaders against a premature uprising, but his attitude towards the heaven storming proletariat 
was that of a practical advisor, of a participant in the struggle of the masses who were raising the whole movement to a higher level in spite of the false theories and, and mistakes of Louis Blanqui and uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph uh, Proudhon. Then Lenin uh, turned to Marx's critique of Kugelman's doubts about the common odds, referring to, quote, the hopelessness of the struggle and to uh, realism as opposed to romanticism. Quote, Marx immediately severely lectured Kugelman, quote, world history, he wrote, would indeed be very easy to make if the struggle were taken up only on condition of infallibility, an infallible favorable uh, condition, Lenin's italics. Marx realized that to attempt in advance to calculate the chances with complete accuracy would be quackery or hopeless pedantry. What he valued above everything else was that the working class heroically and self-sacrificingly took the initiative in making world history. Marx regarded world history from the standpoint of those who make it without being, without being in a position to calculate the chances infallibly beforehand, and not from the standpoint of an intellectual Philistine who moralizes. It was easy to foresee. They should have not taken up arms. Marx was also able to appreciate that there are moments in history when a desperate struggle of the masses, even for a hopeless cause, is essential for the further schooling of these masses and their training uh, for the next struggle, un unquote. I argue that nothing uh, anticipated better than this, uh, uh, this uh, sentiment on the part of uh, Lenin in understanding the Bolsheviks, uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks in the course of, uh, of in, in the course of 19, 1917. I'll end uh, here uh, uh, with Trotsky and uh, Trotsky's assessment uh, of the of the Soviet of the Soviet uh, um, um, experience. And um, I should mention, by the way, that. Uh, in state and revolution, since uh, I think it was Martin who raised about um, Lenin, uh, Lenin never got around to writing about the Soviets in state and revolution, and he explained it why, because he was, he was too busy, the revolution intervened. Um, he never completed, he was never able to complete state and revolution, that would have been, and he explained that that would, a detailed discussion of the Soviets would have been a part of that, but the revolution had intervened, and he once made the comment: "It's better, to, it's better to make a revolution than to write about it." And so that's why it's not, it's not in um, state and in, in revolution. Again, back, uh, back to Trotsky. This is from Trotsky's uh, history of the Rev uh, Russian Re Revolution, nineteen okay. thirty. Okay. Sorry, can I ask you to conclude, please? Okay, good. Can, thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is the last thing I'm reading. <clears throat> This is 1937, quote, the historical ascent of humanity taken as a whole may be summarized as a succession of victories of consciousness over blind forces in nature and society and man himself. Critical and creative thought can boast of its greatest victories up to now in the struggle with nature. The physical chemical sciences have already reached a point where man is clearly about to become master of matter but social relations are still forming in the manner of the coral islands. Parliamentarism illumined only the surface of society and even that with a rather artificial light in comparison with monarchy and other heirlooms from the cannibals and cave dwellers, democracy is of course a great conquest, but it leaves the blind play of forces in the social relations of men untouched. It was against this deeper sphere of the unconscious that the October Revolution was the first to raise its hand. The Soviet system wishes, wishes to bring aim and plan into the very basis of society, where up to now only accumulated consequences have reigned. And I argue that the background and understanding what Trotsky was talking about has its roots in the Paris, in the Paris Commune. Sorry, I went over it, Peter. It's fine, thank you. That was fantastic, really great. I mean, it's really, it's so interesting to hear about 
the, the huge effect that the commune had upon, if you like, the next generation of revolutions, and indeed what you were saying as well about the particular context, just to, uh, you know, ten years earlier, realistically, in the United States. Um, I'm going to move on now and introduce our second speaker, which is who is I keep saying which. I do apologise. Don't know. I seem to have lost my grammar today. Who is? Lindsay, Lindsay German, who's a founding member of Counterfire. I'm sure many people on this call know her and author of various books. Uh, I'll mention a couple. One, uh, Material Girls, and specifically, I think, perhaps not about Paris, but about London, co-author of A People's History of London. And Lindsay is going to be talking about the legacy of the commune. Over to you, Lindsay. Thanks very much, Martin. And it's a great pleasure not just to be speaking with August and, and obviously with Danielle and Shabir as well, but to follow on from that, because it, it, you know, I think he's put such a brilliant context for how we look at the way in which people consider revolutionary upheavals. And I think the thing I'd just like to say, first of all, is that when you go into any struggle, whether it's a small struggle or a big struggle, you never know what the outcome is going to be. You're never certain. You judge it in all sorts of ways, what you think the probabilities are, but you, you're never certain what it's going to be. And I think the great thing about Marx and Engels and Lenin and all the great revolutionaries is the way that they always identify with those struggles, whatever criticisms they might have. And as we know, Marx and Engels particularly Marx, who had loads of communards visiting the exiled in his home afterwards, and uh, they married, two of them married his, uh, his daughters, and the third one was engaged to his youngest daughter. Uh, he, he made a whole number of sort of personal criticisms, but he was absolutely clear that uh, this was a struggle that he wanted to identify with. And I think the first thing I want to say about the legacy is that this was a turning point for the movement and everybody recognised it on the left as a turning point for the movement. That It was a time when, as, as has been said, that they understood, for the, for the first time, they understood very, very clearly that you can't just take hold of the existing machinery of the state, but you have to um, move beyond that. You have to look at how you can destroy the old state and set up a new one. And I think that was hugely important for the older revolutionaries at the time and obviously for the next generations. And if you look at the history of 1848, which was only 23 years before the commune took place, then 1905, then 1917, both in Russia, and uh, the great revolutionary wave after the First World War across Europe. Then, you know, Trotsky wrote once that um, the working class comes to consciousness through the method of a series of appro approximations. In other words, we learn from history and we learn from the kind of struggles that we've been through. And I think for all of us, the Paris Commune was a huge turning point in that development and in the way in which it made possible the future revolutions and future understanding. For that alone, it showed us that working people were capable of making a revolution, were capable of defending their rights, were capable of doing all of those things. So that to me is, is perhaps the first thing to remember it for. The second thing is the question of workers' democracy, because I think when you look at what the commune achieved in the two months of, of it, um, of its existence, it achieved a democracy which hadn't been seen before. And that democracy was such that it wasn't just about people having more rights, which were all very, very important, but it also was a challenge to the economic order. And if you look at the question of the rents and how the rents were controlled, if you look at the regulation of food and how people were able to get food, if you look at things like child labour, other aspects of work, like the bakers not having to work night shifts and all of these kind of things. These were massively important in terms of not just transforming immediate society, but also saying this is the kind of way that we want to live and this is the kind of way that we want to be able to, uh, to do things. So that, that question of democracy, you know, I think today when people sometimes talk about revolution, because it's always characterized as a kind of violent one single act, um, I think it's very important that we understand, firstly, it isn't a violent process most of the time. And if you look at the commune, the violence of the ruling class was is the thing that certainly most sticks in my mind when you look at the um, uh, when you look at its outcome. But also it isn't just one particular act. It is a process where Marx says about we need a revolution, not just to transform the economics of society, not just to transform those 
those economic relations, but also that we transform ourselves and we rid ourselves of what he called the muck of ages in order that we can build society anew, then I think that is an incredible, um, important point to make as well. And I, I think it's very easy for people to forget about democracy because tr democracy has become so traduced in a late capitalist society. It's such, it's such a, uh, the, the reality of what we're told is democracy is so removed from people's lives, is so remote, is so unrepresentative of what real ordinary people really want and what they, and what they need. I think it's very easy for us to forget that actually it is an essential part of socialism. It has to be the involvement of the working population. It has to be the involvement of the people who had nothing but now are able to uh, participate and play an active role in the revolution. So to me, that's one of the more important points. And that leads to the third thing that I wanted to say, which is because it's about the transformation of lives, it has a particular impact on those who are already some of the most oppressed in society. And we've already heard some excellent contributions about the role of women in the in the commune, but it is a remarkable thing uh, how the women took a role, how they took a role in all sorts of different ways and how, again, they began to uh, transform their lives and how they were also very, very, they paid a very, very heavy price for it, both in terms of being killed, of being exiled, deported, um, imprisoned, all of those things, and they did not hesitate to do that. And I think if you look at if you look at the history of all revolutions, actually, you find that the people who, who have been the most oppressed come to the fore. It's true in the English Revolution. It was true in the French Revolution of the 1780s and 1790s. It was true in the Russian Revolution. And the Paris Commune, in a way, is, is one of the great examples that we've got of uh, spelling out what it, uh, what it means. So all of those things, to me, are extremely important when we look at the, uh, the question of the... Uh, of the commune. Um, and I suppose just the final uh, point I wanted to make is this, that it, 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 it prefigures some of the future struggles that take place. Um, obviously, when you talk about 1968 in, in France, uh, lots of the ideas that came out then were ideas which came out in the commune. People looked to the commune as a, as a uh, a previous example in history where these things had happened. And of course, the French have a pretty good tradition if you look through from, well, from 1789 in terms of the, in terms of the revolutions. But even in the 20th century, if you think about the great demonstrations in 1934 against the right-wing fascist attempts in, in Paris, if you look in 1936 at the, um, at the Popular Front movement, the huge strikes and demonstrations that took place then, and of course the liberation in 1944, which is, you know, usually the role of the working class is hidden from the accounts of the liberation, but the working class in Paris was absolutely central to liberating that, uh, that city. And you have the great transformation in 1968, the general strike. And I just want to read um, one of the things that was said about, um, about 1968 by uh, an author who, who wrote a book on the commune. He said, the barricades in the Latin Quarter in May 68 were identical to many of those of May 71, 1871, down to the metal grills thrown on after the pave, the paving stones had been dug up. Only the overturned cars distinguished them from the horse-drawn buses, horse buses and cabs of the earlier epoch. And that, I think, when we look at the inspiration of re more recent struggles, is very, very important for us. And I remember, I went to Portugal in 74 and 75 when you had the revolution which took place, firstly the revolution of the flowers, but it became much more of a kind of um, a class conscious revolution and much more of a workers revolution in the following year. But I remember staying in a seaside resort in 1974, just outside Lisbon, and uh, you couldn't get bread rolls on a Sunday. And that's because as a result of the revolution, people didn't work. Sundays uh, anymore and the, and they took over. Uh, they had a movement in Portugal to drive out the fascist secret police from the workplaces. They had movements to take over newspapers and uh, and radio stations which were um, which were broadcasting against the revolution. And some of those things, and we had it in Chile in, the, in exactly the same period, 
So for me, the commune isn't just about history, it's about what we do today and what we do tomorrow and the possibility of um, building political organisation, the possibility of learning from not just the mistakes of the past, because you know, we should also remember the successes of the past and the important ways in which the communards and the Russian revolutionaries and all the different groups made such an impact on history and how much we're very much in their debt. So I think when we look at the legacy, we should remember it as socialism today takes a huge amount from the commune and from the ideas of the commune. And, and that is something we should uh, we should remember. Oh, thank you, Lindsay. That's great. And hugely agree with everything you said. And I think, you know, we need to think of the commune, don't we, as about possibility and possibility for the present and the future. Just briefly on 68, there will be an article up on the Counterfire website next week about the commune in 68 for anyone who's particularly interested in that period. Um, right. I'm now going to uh, turn to our third speaker. And we've had six fantastic speakers so far. What we haven't had is anyone in Paris. So we're going to change that now. And we're going to have Daniela Bono, who is a, an, an MP or a, a, sorry, a member of the National Assembly. I was using the English term there and has been since 2017 and a spokesperson for La, Fran La France Insoumise. Um, she wants to call her contribution Time for the People. So over to you, Danielle. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to this, uh, this great moment of internationalism and, and socialism. Uh, I, I really commend you for organizing this, especially since um, in France, there is no official national celebration of the, of the commune. There have been many things organized by left-wing groups and, and, and over groups. But the, the government, especially uh, Emmanuel Macron, is uh, rather planning to celebrate the 200th anniversary of uh, Napoleon's death. You know, it will be happening next next May and they've been talking about that and I think it's very um, uh, interesting because as you know Napoleon is the one who uh, with the coup uh, ended the first revolution and uh, and uh, and re-established slavery and uh, introduced a, a new civil code that um, undermined and and put women into an, an inferior position so you got this uh, uh, the power now in France are celebrating this uh, a so-called great figure that is very reactionary actually and very authoritarian and i think it's all the more important to celebrate la commune and what it represents until today and to to to, to say how much is still very much alive not just in france but all around the world so thank you so much for uh, for being part of this uh this celebratory moment I wanted to talk about uh, how uh, the commune is very much alive and echoes with um, many things happening and how we can, it's still very, uh, a great inspiration uh, today. And uh, I really loved uh, uh, all the, the speakers and, and how you, you really uh, explained uh, and very vividly uh, how, uh, what happened in those days. And I wanted to focus on, on three, three, three things that to me are, are very striking uh, when you think about the La Commune. First is, and, and many others, I've already talked about it. It's a it's a it's a it's a very uh, people's moment. It's a it's people's uh, into power, and I think uh, we shouldn't underestimate it. Uh, how um, revolutionary it was, because we're talking about a time when uh, there have been a lot of uprising, unrest. <clears throat> there have been over the those that century uh, three uh, big revolution, but the very difference is when. Uh, <clears throat> La Commune happened. It were people, actually workers, that um, that were <coughs> sorry. <coughs> um, it was actually working class people who uh, took over, and and um, I'm sorry, can you hear me? <laughs> sorry. So, and it was working class people that, uh, that took uh, to the power. And I think, <clears throat> and it, it, it's especially interesting that it, is ap it happened in a moment of, 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 of great uh, suffering for the people because they've been undergoing um, war and starvation and, and, the, uh, and all the 
recollections and, and description of that time are, are very haunting about what they've been experiencing. And I think to me, it shows uh, how capable the people are. I think it, it, it really uh, spoke to me, especially today when we have been undergoing this COVID uh, uh, health crisis and more of this political crisis uh, because of the way most governments um, dealt with, with the COVID. And what we saw during those, those moments, how uh, workers were the one who actually went uh, to the forefront of the, of the battle against the crisis and especially health workers and showed actually, especially in France, there where the government has been has been really um, failing at, at addressing the, 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 the health situation. And were workers, health workers, and um and and uh, and and all those people that usually are unseen and and devalued that actually help us you know survive over the past the past year and showed actually uh who are the one who are running the the, the society who are the one who makes it possible to run the society and it's it's so much it's so important to remind it that uh, not only we are running the, the society day to day but we are able uh, to rise to the occasion to, to actually take over power. And it's very powerful, especially I, I was rereading uh, many things about, about the commune and, and um, especially you got this, this poster uh, in, in January uh, in 1871. And, uh, and, and when the, the people are just calling out the government because they were uh, just incompetent and, uh, and they say by their slowness, their indecision, their initiative, Inertia, they led us to the edge of the abyss. They were neither able to administer nor to fight, whereas they had all the resources, the goods and the men at hand. They did not know how to foresee anything. Where there could have been abundance, they created misery. People are dying of cold, almost of hunger. And this is one of the posters that, uh, that was plastered all around Paris. And that really helped build the momentum to the to 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 the to the commune and and the declaration of the commune and really to me it shows how much um, and at a time of absolute despair uh, the one actually able to to, to run the society to, to to fight back when when something happens whether whether it's war or it's you know this pandemic happening are the workers and you've been and it's, it's been said that uh, all the people who took part in in, in the movement were regular people. Uh, very and, and the one who are actually usually despised by the power and it's very uh, also important. You've been talking about how the how the even some uh, some artists really uh, talk about the people in the in the common our our our, our uh, full of contempt and 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 talking them uh, talking them down actually and we're very afraid and you talk about even Hugo Victor Hugo these great uh this great figure was very ambivalent about it but you had major figure like georges sand uh, or flaubert who were very uh aggressive against the, the movement and it, of course to me it echoes very much what happened in france uh over the past uh, couple of years regarding especially the yellow vest movement which is one also one of the uh, uh, uh the most original popular movement, working class movement that happened. Working class in the sense it's, it's the people actually, it's not just those working, but also those unemployed and the way they were portrayed or as, as just the same way uh, the, 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 the common uh, people have been, have been portrayed. And you see this at this uh, head rate from the work for, from the ruling class about people rising and fighting. And of course, the, 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 the brutal repression that, 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 um, that uh, uh, ensued when when people are rising. So to, to me, it's really th this idea that um, people's power is not just something in theory. That's just nothing like we 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 dream about. This is what happened over and over again throughout history, and especially in La Commune, and that is still happening to 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 this day. The second point I wanted to, to focus on is the um, internationalism of this us movement. Um, it, the commune didn't just happen in Paris, it happened in, in several other cities in, in, in France, but also it happened uh, in uh, Algier, uh, in Algeria. 
at the time where it was a, 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 a it was a, a colony it was being colonized by france and they actually as a, a, a commune a movement happened there and there were also a lot of of people from algeria in france in paris uh, uh, at the time and uh, and to me it's very interesting how much internationalist it was because it's been said and uh, a lot of um, migrant workers uh, from uh, East Europe were part of the movement and they were part of the internationalist uh, socialist movement at the time they, they, they played an uh, important role in, in the in the event and one of the very progressive measures the uh, commune took uh, was to enable uh, even migrant people to, to, to vote not women but uh, men uh, whether they were French or, or or for other parts of Europe were able to vote, and you got this, uh, and even women, uh, Russian um, uh, from Poland and, and from all over Europe were part of this movement. And I think it's very interesting also because this is a movement that started um, as a some kind of patriotic but also anti-imperialist movement because it it started because people refused uh, to to let the to let uh, the, the, the German imperialist power uh, to further humiliate France and, and, and with the, the government uh, uh, actually uh, uh, capitulating to, 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 to the Germans. And it, 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 it feels like it's very, uh, it, it's, to me, it's the, the anti-nationalism uh, at, at core because it was the idea that they were protecting the Republic with the idea of universal rights. And, and it, it was also made of people from, from all around the world. So I think it, it was the internationalism of this is very important. And, uh, and of course, I think about all the, what has been happening over, over the past decades, we've, we've, we've also commemorating the 18th anniversary of the Iraq war and, 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 and what has been happening in Iraq also its, its movements and, and, and people's uh, uh, resisting uh, what has been happening. And it's very powerful also to see how imperialism creates also within the countries themselves um, seeds of revolt, seeds of uprising. And it's very important uh, to me to point this out. So I, I wanted to end with um, uh, the, the, the name itself, La Commune, which is to me speaks so much about um, the idea of uh, not just communism, but what we have in common, common goods. And I think it's a, such a, a powerful idea, especially today, when we've been working a lot um, with my colleagues uh, about the the idea of um, uh, of a new deal, uh, the green new deal, and environmental change. And there's a lot of of of, of those uh, debates happening about uh, how do we save from the market? What is common to us, like hair, water, and and those common goods? And to me, the idea of la commune is also uh, working class people uh, wanting to actually get together and work together uh, for the common goods and to preserve those uh, essential things in lives and, and to, 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 to keep pushing the boundaries of, of emancipation. And I think it's such a, a, a very a modern and a very a lively idea still very at the heart of all our uh, emancipation movement. So um, to really conclude, I would say, the, the, the La Commune is very much alive and, uh, and, uh, and I'm very happy to be commemorating it with you today. And we're very happy you agreed to come, Danielle. Thank you. That was great and really great to hear you bring, uh, well, I talk about the situation in France, but also talk about the very specific ways in which the Commune is still relevant now um, to, and to what you're doing and what your comrades are doing at the moment. And it's great to hear that. Okay, our last speaker for the day is Shabir Lakar, who is editor of the Counter Fire website and the People's Assembly activist and Stop the War officer. And indeed, if I may say, has also been one of the people central to organising uh, this event. So over to you, Shabir. Thanks a lot, Martin. Um, and, and thanks to everyone who's, who's spoken so far. This has been a, a fantastic and really inspiring event. Um, and I hope I can, I can do justice being on this panel. Um, and problem with being the last speaker is that there's uh, often a lot of repetition, but I'll try and keep that to a, a minimum. Um, the things I wanted to talk about, I mean, I think there are, are many lessons to take from the Paris Commune, and I think chief among them is the idea uh, and the demonstration that working people have the ability to organize society themselves, 
um, and that within the removal of class society lies the seeds for the liberation of women and ethnic minorities. Um, <clears throat> remembering the commune and what it showed us are, um, I think, particularly pertinent today because we're living through a moment of profound crisis for the ruling class, um, of heightened politicization and dissatisfaction with those who are running our society, um, and a growing desire for fundamental change. Um, and I want to talk about two things in particular, both of which happened in the have happened in the last year, and which show, I think, why the memory of the commune is not something distant, but very much alive today. Um, and the first is the Black Lives Matter protest in the US last year. Um, as people will know, after the brutal murder of, of George Floyd by police officers in Minneapolis, mass protests erupted uh, across the country and then internationally. And these have now become the biggest protest movement in US history. Um, and there were some real radical elements of the movement that I think are worth touching on. Um, the, the protests were met with, with massive repression from the state. Uh, police officers, riot police, uh, and then even military personnel were deployed to quash the protest. Uh, but protesters fought back. And in Minneapolis, they forced the police to, to retreat uh, and evacuate their precinct, and then they burnt it down. Uh, and polls showed that there was popular support in the US for this. And this led in Seattle, uh, where protesters were clashing with the police on a daily basis, to the forcing out of the police uh, from one of the central neighborhoods in the city and the setting up of the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone uh, or Capitol Hill Organized Protest, as it was later called. Um, and what protesters did was erect barricades around a, a six block uh, radius in the city. Uh, and they described themselves as a commune. They took direct inspiration from the Paris Commune. Um, now, it wasn't on the same scale as the Paris Commune, and the, the protesters weren't able to take over the functioning of the state uh, in the area. Um, it was, in effect, a concession made by the city's mayor that allowed them to stay in place uh, for as long as they did. Um, it wasn't driven by workers and didn't assume the production of, in society and uh, or the re redistribution of, of wealth. But nonetheless, it was a serious challenge to the state. Um, and there are a number of things that happened in those four weeks of its existence that are worth remarking on. Um, while the, the zone operated, there was communalized food provisions within the area. Uh, free health clinics were set up, uh, which considering the lack of free or even cheap healthcare in the United States was quite a feat. Um, there were nightly free street concerts uh, for everyone to enjoy. Uh, the area was transformed with art and murals uh, and a general assembly was set up to make collective decisions. From this assembly, they put together a list of demands, including for free housing, free education, free healthcare, uh, for the defunding of the police and so on. And they managed to win part of these uh, demands when they agreed to end the autonomous zone in July. Um, and during the four weeks without the police in the area, uh, there was no law enforcement at all. Um, when the zone was threatened by uh, the fascist Proud Boys, armed anti-fascists guarded the barricades. And there was, like during the Paris Commune, a reduction in crime. And I think this is an important point given uh, the, the events in the last two weeks here in Britain with the horrific murder of, of Sarah Everard, uh, which a police officer has been charged for with her murder. Um, and, you know, the way the vigils were violently attacked by the police and subsequently that Boris Johnson has asserted that part of the solution to ending violence against women is, in fact, more police officers, uh, including undercover officers, patrolling clubs and bars and the rest of it. And, and Lindsay's actually done a really great video debunking this, which is which is on our website, which I recommend people watch. But I think the commune and the experience uh, of the Capitol Hill uh, Autonomous Zone is also a direct refutation of this area. When there are no police, when ordinary people are in control, uh, and in the case of the Paris Commune, when there was a redistribution of wealth and a, and a control of the means of production, uh, this tackled the fundamental roots of crime and, and the removal of class society was what tackled uh, violence against women, uh, not police officers. And though it was short-lived, uh, the Autonomous Zone inspired protesters around the country to do the same, most notably in, in Portland, but also in Washington, D.C., in North Carolina, um, and in Philadelphia, health workers and nurses uh, occupied a, a disused hospital and began treating people for free. Um, these were all even shorter lived uh, and faced the full force of the state to dismantle them, but they showed a glimpse of what can be achieved by ordinary people in the here and now. Um, and they showed, I think, 
in in comparison to the Paris Commune, that central to this has to be organized workers, um, you know, to, to creating fundamental change and the necessity of overthrowing class society altogether. Um, in, in the wider Black Lives Matter movement, we saw uh, on the protest netters coming to, to treat protesters after 12 hour shifts. We saw bus drivers refusing to transport uh, arrested protesters. Um, and as a result of the movement and the pandemic, there's been a massive initiative to unionize uh, precarious workers, particularly black workers, uh, and especially in Amazon. And we're seeing this play out dramatically in Alabama at the moment. Um, and again, I think this shows how class-based solidarity uh, and a systemic understanding of racism is key to black liberation. And people have talked about how this happened uh, within the Paris Commune as well. <clears throat> and this leads me to the second thing I want to talk about, which is a more general situation uh, with the pandemic over the last 12 months. There's been a stark rise in consciousness of the role of workers in society, the idea of who is actually essential uh, to running society and how little benefit the likes of hedge fund managers and bankers are to the running of society. Um, and we've seen a complete failure uh, of the state in dealing with the pandemic. And I think it's fair to say, based on polls, uh, et cetera, that had ordinary people been in charge over the last 12 months, we wouldn't have entered lockdown late. We wouldn't have handed over billions of pounds worth of contracts to the richest and most inexperienced people in society who completely failed. Uh, we wouldn't have denied foods to, to poor children. Uh, we wouldn't have given nurses a, a real terms pay cut and instead spent billions of pounds on nuclear weapons. Um, and I think this realization that, that people are having is dangerous for the ruling class because capitalist society depends on the idea that the state is supreme, that those who govern us are superior to us. And this is falling apart uh, in the eyes of millions of people. Um, what the working people in Paris 150 years ago did is dismantle this idea. The state functionaries vacated the city and ordinary workers to control. They created democratic councils for decision making and anyone working for the government was only entitled to the same pay as, as other workers uh, and was subject to recall by the people. It was a fantastic demonstration of what society run by the people for the people uh, actually looks like. And I think this spirit and this example is what we need to put at the heart of our organizing, because I think I think it was Jonas who, who commented earlier in the first session. Uh, and, and I think he was right when he said that one of the key things we need to get over is this mistrust of working people's uh, own abilities and ideas. Um, and I find even in conversations that I have with, with my friends sometimes who fully agree with criticisms of the government, uh, even with some of the, you know, the fundamental flaws and contradictions of capitalism. But when it comes to the idea of ordinary people being able to do better, they project the flaws of capitalism onto people themselves. Um, you know, this idea that socialism couldn't work because people are greedy, um, uh, people, people will be lazy, you know, racism and sexism are inherent features of human society and so on. Um, but the Paris Commune is a brilliant example of why this isn't the case. Um, and uh, people's ideas uh, change and develop in the process of struggle. Um, as Marx said in uh, the Civil War in, in France, I'll just quote a quick um, uh, passage. Uh, the working class did not expect miracles from the commune. They have no, uh, they have no ready-made utopias to introduce. They know that in order to work out their own emancipation and along with it, that higher form to which present society is irresistibly tending by its own economical agencies, they will have to pass through long struggles, through a series of historic processes, transforming circumstances and men. They have no ideals to realize, but to set free the elements of, of the new society, which with which old collapsing bourgeois society is itself pregnant. Um, because the fundamental transformation of society has to be an act of the working class itself. And of course, the development of workers' organization depends on socialist ideas that win these arguments and agitate on these grounds to make such a moment possible in the first place. Like, I don't think it was a coincidence uh, that the Capitol Hill uh, Autonomous Zone happened and most successfully in Seattle, which was the seat of the anti-capitalist movement 20 years uh, prior. Uh, similar to why the Paris Commune happened in Paris because of, of the revolutionary history of the previous decades. Um, so, you know, as, as the great revolutionary Fred Hampton said, 
um, and I recommend watching the, the new movie about him, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, we need to heighten the contradictions. Um, and I think it's also a lesson for the left that socialism has to come from below. Uh, it has to come with a massive expansion of democracy for the majority in society. As Marx made it clear in his only correction to the Communist Manifesto, and as others have said, um, that we cannot simply seize the state and wield it for our own means. We have to dismantle it through our own real democracy. Um, so to wrap up, I, I think that we need to, to build socialist organization. We need to strengthen the revolutionary current within uh, the social movements and build as much class solidarity within them as possible. Um, we need to argue that racism and sexism um, will be ended through organizing collectively uh, on a class basis, as opposed to limiting the fight to something that can only be taken up by oppressed groups alone. And I think at the moment where the false division between the political and the economic is the thinnest it has been in a long time, I don't think it's a surprise that now is the time that we're seeing a significant increase in trade union activity and strikes. And, I, and we need to really amplify this as much as we can and generalize it as much as we can. And one example, which I'll end on, um, to mention how these struggles can join up, um, as well as what I mentioned about Black Lives Matter and, and unionizing in Amazon, is that last year here in Britain, workers uh, at the Rolls-Royce factory in Barnoldswick went on strike and won. And part of the deal that they won was not just keeping their factory open, but it was that it would become a center for planning how to change Rolls-Royce's production towards green technology. And I think the, you know, the marrying of working class organization has to be central to all the campaigns that we have against uh, war, against climate change, um, racism and sexism and, and everything else. And I think these are the things that we need to build on and spread in the spirit of the commune. Thank you. Thanks, Shabir. And I think it's great that you ended with, a, if you like, a call to action. Um, I, I began before the first speaker in this panel by saying that we wanted to do this session because we didn't want the commune just to be an historical event that sat there as something that happened in the past and wasn't relevant. And you've sort of nicely rounded that off, really. Um, one more comment, if I may, before we go to speakers. Um, sometimes when you're at an event, when there's eight speakers, you are losing the will to live. I could have to listen to another four or five. So that's my compliment to everyone today. I think it's been excellent. And uh, people have had really interesting things to say. And it's been really varied as well. Right. OK, if we can go to speakers, I can see two hands up so far. I've also got a couple of questions I've taken from the chat. Uh, I'm going to go to John, first of all, and then Mark. John Reese and Mark Pachani. If I, can, if I ask you to unmute, please, John. Thanks. Great, great, great panel. Um, I, I just want to make the, the, the point about the centrality of the kind of democracy that the Paris Commune had to the whole tradition of genuine socialism. And it seems to me there's two aspects to this. Firstly, the formal democratic elements of the uh, Commune were superior in every way to the best of the parliamentary regimes that we see in the existing society. Instantly recallable deputies, deputies paid at workers' wages, uh, a real organic relationship between electors and the people representing uh, them. Uh, no uh, um, capitalist parliament has dared introduce the idea of instantly recallable deputies uh, to, this, uh, to this day. But more importantly than that, or as importantly as that, this was democracy extended into the realm of economics. The best that you get in this society is an emaciated political democracy and then autocracy in the economic sphere. Amazon is an autocracy. BP is an autocracy. Uh, there is no democratic element in the economic sphere whatsoever. And the commune broke down that wall and gave us really what is a good short definition of socialism, which is uh, democracy extended into the sphere of economics. And I think this is a touchstone by which you can judge any uh, socialist project. It simply isn't socialism if it's simply about state control. You know, Engels was or either of the kind of Labour Party variety or of the kind of Stalinist variety. Um, Engels was scathing about this. He said, if nationalization equals socialism, then the tailors in the regimental army and the royal porcelain manufacturer would be socialist institutions. It's not just a question of does the state control the economy, it's a question of who controls the state. Is there a democratic mechanism 
which controls the state. And if there isn't, then we're not in the presence of a genuine uh, socialist movement. And I think those are important fundamental touchstones really for any socialist in any age uh, to, to, be, uh, to be honest. The final point I want to make is this. It's about can working people do it? Well, the commune shows that they can. But to be honest, I don't think you even need as grand, a, um, as grand an example as the Paris Commune. I mean, quite frankly, today, I think if I went out on the streets of Hackney where I live and picked half a dozen people off the street, could they really be any worse than this government? I mean, could we not find somebody with more human feeling than Pretty Patel? Could we not find somebody a little bit brighter than Gavin Williamson? Uh, might it not be possible to find somebody with greater organisational skills than Matt Hancock or somebody who isn't a congenital liar to be prime minister? I mean, it seems to me that working people have 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 rumbled this. It's one of the great uh, triumphs of the age that they think themselves more moral, better organised and more capable than the government that's uh, ruling over them. And and who can blame them? This government is a homicidal government. It's killed 130,000 of its own citizens. We'd have to be making terrible mistakes to be doing worse than that. Thank you, John. Uh, that was a fantastic contribution. Lots of things to think about there. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mark now, Mark Pochani, then Kate Connolly after that. Do you want to unmute, Mark? Hi, comrades. Can you hear me OK? Right, cheers. Thanks. Uh, I'm glad John finished that. To be perfectly frank, I think my dog... Floyd's got more compassion humanity than Boris Johnson, the rest of the Tory cabinet put together. Um, I, I'm really, I'm really pleased that August Nance is here, here today. I first came across him on the anniversary, the 85th anniversary of the, the Russian Revolution in Florence, where a comrade dumped me a box of an article he had written, we had translated into Italian to be sold at the European Social Forum. And I'm glad that dang it, and I'm glad that he was mentioning the relationship of the Paris Commune to the emancip. To the, to the you know the emancipation movements that were in America and the Reconstruction because I think uh, because I came across a, a, an article by a speech by Charles Sumner who was quite a leading role in the anti-slavery movement who was speaking about what the Franco-Prussian War meant for the ruling class in America shortly before the Paris Commune and I think actually the ruling class understand the Paris Commune better than we do at times and if you look at if you look at what they've done. After the Paris Commune, in terms of of, of the, what happened with the military industrial complex, even till today, they still understand it. If you think about during the war in Iraq, when Fallujah happened, they deliberately, the ruling class called them insurgents. And if you think how they bombed Fallujah in, 19, in 2004, it's because they knew a communal situation was starting to develop in Iraq, and there's still elements of that today. I don't think there's any point that's coming together today if we don't talk about the true lesson of what the Paris Commune is, and that is the need for organisation and, and, and for revolutionary organisation around revolutionary Marxism. These, this isn't just a history lesson, and I want to encourage that if you have been inspired by today, that you join Counterfire and you compare the process to ensure that actually coming out of this lockdown and events we have coming ahead, that actually we have the revolutionary organisation to ensure that when we have our communes, we actually win, comrades. Thanks, Mark. Yes, indeed. Couldn't agree more. Um, it's very important that we keep our minds on what is happening today when we're thinking about what happened 150 years ago. Over to you, Kate, if you'd like to unmute, please, and ask your question, make your contribution. Thank you. Um, and thanks for an, an amazing, um, uh, amazing four, four speakers introducing this. Um, I, I, wanted, I was thinking about this phrase that people use when... Um, when there's even like the, the merest suggestion that taxes on the rich might be raised just a tiny bit. Um, and uh, quite often, like the most reactionary people say things like the rich will leave the country. Um, and I was thinking about this in the context of the commune when obviously the rich left the city um, and it helped everybody create a much more equal society. Um, but I think what people mean when they use that phrase is the rich aren't going to stand for it. They, they will sabotage any attempts at, at making a more equal society. And um, it, I think it's a recognition that people have that, you know, for all the kind of um, the sort of very limited democracy, the way in which we're not allowed um, democratic control over economic questions is so that one class um, in society can remain dominant and is determined to remain 
dominant. And I sort of feel like there are moments when people, when that kind of becomes highlighted and people see that um, as well. And people see how unsafe we're made in our, our current society. And they see how that's been going on for a very, very long time. I think that's certainly what happened in Paris in 1871. People felt that the French ruling class were making ordinary people unsafe. They were prepared to let for their own selfish class interests. Um, the, the German army just sort of sweep um, through Paris. They were going to let the poorest in society suffer the most. And I want to ask, do you think we're living through with with the experience of COVID? Do you think we're living through a, a kind of similar moment where people are realizing that um, our ruling class do make us unsafe and, and don't have our best interests at heart? And also with the kind of uh, with some of the movements that we've seen erupt on the streets, I'm thinking particularly um, against violence against black people in the Black Lives Matter movement, violence against women um, in, in the movement um, that's just emerged in the last week or so. Do you think that's also why um, state violence has come so much under the, the spotlight um, in, in both of those movements as well? Thank you, Kate. Thanks very much. Right, before I go to Isabel and then to John Westmoreland, I'm going to read out a couple of questions that have come in the chat. The first is from Tom Griffiths, who is indeed involved in the People's COVID Inquiry, which is what this pertains to. Thinking about the People's COVID Inquiry, I wonder if the panellists have knowledge and thoughts about the justice system of the commune. How are courts run, if at all? We've heard about the abolition of the police, but what of the judiciary or was that abolished as well? And then also I'm going to read out from Ian Drummond. Just need to find it. It's just moved. Or oh, Ian, do you want to, I don't know, Sorry, this is the problem. The, the chat moves so quickly, you then lose it. If someone could put that in the... Ah, I haven't got it. OK, so a question for Danielle from Ian Drummond. What are the prospects for France in the next year? What are the chances of France and Soumise and the wider movement disrupting polarisation between a neoliberal centre and far right with Macron and Le Pen to feeding off each other? Does La France and Soumise openly celebrate and commemorate the commune in a way we've been doing this afternoon? And then also he wishes you were standing for president. So there you are. OK, I'll hand over to Isabel now. If you want to unmute yourself, please, Isabel. Thanks, Martin. Uh, and thanks again to all the speakers for a fantastic second session. This is just a quick question to Danielle as well, really. I just wondered, how is the commune viewed and presented by the academic establishment and the political establishment in present day France? And how do the people see it? And does that contrast? Thanks. Thanks, Isabel. OK, uh, we've got that for later for the panel. Uh, John, over to you, if you'd like to unmute. Uh, yeah, just a quick, quick point, really, about democracy in the commune, because, um, you know, the, it's just, it might surprise people to know that the, the communards are very, very interested in democracy. They weren't that obsessed with universal suffrage um, because they said, you know, the question of how we vote is a secondary question to the nature of the state. If a state is unjust, and if power is locked into a tiny minority and votes aren't gonna make any difference, we're not too bothered about it. We're interested in making the state just, you know, workable, and then to think about how we vote about things. And, you know, I mean, for people like, uh, you know, who want to wage war on Iraq for democracy, their idea is that if they put some ballot boxes up, that's going to solve things. Whereas the fundamental understanding of all socialists is that you need to change the nature of government, the nature of the state, you know, abolish the capitalist state, in order to be able to have any real democracy which asks you to participate as an equal. Thank you, John. Um, we've got a, at least about 15 minutes or so more before we're going to go back to the panel, but we don't have any hands up at present. So can I encourage people to ask some more questions, please, or make some more contributions? That would be great. Otherwise, you're going to have to listen to my dulcet northern tones for the next 15 minutes. I should make someone put their hand up, one would imagine. No, it's not worked. Anybody? Any more? Any more uh, I know there's an interesting conversation going on about Kronstadt in, this, in the chat, but perhaps that's not quite what we want in the main discussion ah brilliant we've got chris and then richard um over to you chris if you'd like to unmute please yeah i just wanted to um make a little reflection on the whole question of um memory and, and remembrance because 
Um, Danielle made the point that, um, you know, I suppose not surprisingly, the French ruling class doesn't have Commune Day in its uh, in its calendar and has, isn't doing anything to, to remember it. And I guess that will be uh, the case for um, ruling classes everywhere, really. And you can sort of understand that from their point of view. But I think it's also true that it's not inevitable that the the lessons of history, the kind of accumulated experience of class struggle over the last few hundred years uh, are uh, maintained and sustained within the labour movement itself. And I mean, this is, I think this is something that is worth just thinking about a bit because just thinking about our recent history in this country, if if the lessons of the commune around the question of the separation of politics and economics and around the kind of nature of the state that was revealed in those um, in those 72 days, if those lessons had been carried forward into, for example, the Corbyn project, I think the movement around Corbynism would have looked somewhat different. And actually, people might have been less surprised about some of the outcomes of that whole uh, of that whole episode. And um, so uh, someone just uh, raised a minute ago the question of kind of socialist organization and revolutionary organization. And I think one of the ways to think about revolutionary organization and its importance is that what we're trying to do is precisely to keep in mind uh, the, the lessons from previous struggles and to kind of use them to form an overall picture and to enrich our understanding of how um, the struggle for socialism can go forward. And I think what we what we need to be thinking about is as we, I agree with people when they say, I think we're, we're beginning to see a new wave of struggles taking place, but we need to, the point of socialist organization is to try and make sure that those memories are kind of inserted directly into the active struggles um, that, uh, that, that, that take place because if they're not then the danger is we kind of end up in a, a constant cycle of learning and unlearning and potential defeat so I think that's one of the one of the ways to, to see the importance of revolutionary organization um, moving forward. Thanks Chris that's a really important point indeed um, right we have uh, in order I'm going to go to Richard and then I'm going to go to Ian and I've got a couple more speakers after that but Richard first please if you'd like to unmute. Thank you for that. Um, and I hope I'm not going to be taking the discussion sideways on this. But of course, when we're talking about the Paris Commune, and I've seen some of the um, comments in the chat, particularly relating how uh, opposition to imperialism and colonialism uh, has impacted from the home countries of those struggles back to the imperialist states uh, in Europe and in North America, actually, as it comes to that. Uh, and I was reminded that I'm in no way comparing it to the commune per se. But uh, Britain is not exempt from the internal war on its own citizens. And I'm thinking particularly about the resistance to the British state that led to the formation of what was popularly known as Free Derry. Uh, and that led me to another point, which perhaps is most directed at Danielle, uh, which is that I don't know what the position was in the commune or even if the communards regarded religion as a matter of significance. But the opposition to the role of the British state in Ireland was not fundamentally a religious imperative, even though it may have been articulated that way. It was uh, a roar of discontent from the voiceless. And it was portrayed by the British state uh, who tried to put it into uh, religious ghettoization. And it occurred to me that France uh, today, as an outsider from a position of ignorance, Danielle, that a whole swathe of the voiceless, the dispossessed, the working class, in France is portrayed as the other. Uh, I'm thinking in particular about um, the, the French Muslims and the way in which we as a left have 
kind of left them to struggle on their own. And I'm just wondering, what is the chance of um, solidarity, the continual attacks they get, cultural, to what clothing they're allowed to wear, what manifestations of their beliefs they're allowed to wear. And I'm just wondering, one, did the commune have anything to say on this matter? And two, what do you see as the chances of them being welcomed into um, the French body politic instead of continually being treated as aliens? Ta. Thanks, Richard. OK, we've got three more speakers, and then I think there'll probably be time to come back to the panel. So in order, we're going to have Ian, and then Kieran, I'm guessing, uh, and then Tukumbo. OK, over to you, Ian, if you'd like to unmute, please. Yeah, um, well, mine, mine's more to do with uh, thanking everybody that's made such a fantastic Sunday afternoon. Um, as somebody who's fairly recently, within the last five, six years, really since Corbyn was elected, come to being involved in politics. The Paris Commune is pretty much totally new to me, even though I studied the French Revolution in uh, at school. I find this is, it's been a, a fascinating and wholly enlightening afternoon. I know the sun's shining quite nicely outside and I've missed all that, but to have missed this for the sun would have been a, a tragedy to be fair. Um, so, yeah, that was all I wanted to say. It's just been a fantastic event. And to thank everybody, A, that's taken part, but B, mainly to Counterfire for actually putting it um, on and uh, and gathering all the excellent speakers that you've had on here. It's It's been really fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ian. We never, ever discourage people from saying that they've enjoyed something. <laughs> so it's nice to hear that. That's great. Thanks very well, much. I, I haven't got enough of a good enough contribution to make other, other than that. It's a, it's a perfectly good one, I promise you. Thank you very much. Right, uh, Kieran, if I can ask you to unmute, please. Over to you. Still muted. Have you been sent a... Can you see a thing to unmute? A little button. You should be being sent a an invitation to unmute. I think I can do it, actually. Hang on. Got it? Yeah, yeah. Good. thanks. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, yeah, just to uh, echo what Ian said, it's been a fantastic event, absolutely inspiring speakers. Um, and um, it's there's many been many echoes of uh, another really inspiring event that me and my wife, Tracy, attended yesterday, the annual general meeting of the International Brigades Memorial Trust, and then the Len Crone uh, Memorial Lecture in the afternoon and for the international brigades, it's a matter of education now um, that it's not on the curriculum, that youngsters don't know about the massive mobilization of working class people right across Europe, right across with the world in the middle of the 1930s. Um, and like that, the Paris Commune is not there in public consciousness as a major turning point in history that it should be. Um, and yesterday talking about uh, the people of Spain and the theme was, why were the, why were the brigaders prepared to lay down their lives for the Spanish Republic? And why were the Spanish people prepared to die against this military machine? Um, and ultimately it's down to two things, the prospect of fascism triumphing. That defensive struggle is absolutely necessary and everything must be thrown into it. And that's what inspired working class people from Britain and right across Europe and the world to go to Spain. And the other thing was the prefigurative, the prefiguring of a new egalitarian, better world. The prospect of a beacon creating a new kind of society in Spain, mobilised people. And that was there in the commune. There was the defence against the reimposition of an authoritarian tyranny or a better world, socialism or barbarism, as Rosa Luxemburg said. 
Thanks very much for that, Kieran. It's really good to hear about, the, well, indeed, yesterday's event that you mentioned, but also, of course, about the relationship between the commune and, uh, and what happened in Spain in '36. Right, I've got the two last speakers. Please, no more hands after this. We won't have time for any more. So just to, to terms of anyone else who was thinking of speaking, I'm going to go to Tacumbo, and I'm going to go to Carol. If you want to uh, unmute yourself, please, Tacumbo. Uh, thank you very much, comrades. I mean, first and foremost, I, I'd like to thank Counterfire, you know, for putting on this event. I mean, it's been an afternoon you know, uh, you know, very, very well spent. And uh, funny enough, uh, the same ideas of democracy, of workers' control, and so on and so forth, are the same ideas that we were having in a discussion yesterday uh, with socialists from Nigeria, you know, where I come from. I must say that of all Marx's literature, uh, the Civil War in France is something that I read over and over and over again, you know, because every read, you know, throws forward, you know, new ideas, you know, and coming, you know, on, on the back of what John Rees said, one of the things that Marx articulates is that the commune delivered up the bourgeois' wet dream, which was cheap government, you know, and cheap government basically because of the fact that, look, you don't have all these flunkies like special advisors earning loads and loads of money for doing nothing. Basically, what you have is, you know, people being elected, you know, on, uh, you know, on a worker's salary. You have those that make the revolution being armed and you had the artificial divide you know, between administration and legislation collapsing. And it's not, if I may say so, uh, I mean, it's not accidental that we're discussing the commune today because considering the kind of crisis that we face at the moment, you know, which is the planet, it's not just the pandemic, it's the economic crisis, it's the planetary crisis, all rolled into a crisis of capitalism. You know, so we need to be clear that we need to finish this system before this system finishes us. And with the commune, you know, we have the inspiration to know that working people can mobilize, take the system on and build a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Tukumbo. Thanks very much. And uh, for our last speaker, before we go back to the panel, uh, I'd like to call Carol, if you'd like to unmute yourself, please. Hi, yeah. Um, given that um, we saw so many thousands of women actually mobilizing spontaneously following uh, Sarah Everard's death at the uh, hands of a police officer, allegedly. Um, I want to know how we can continue to um, fire up girls and women, because girls and women are there and they are ready to do things. They are on the ground. They are working in mutual aid and other organisations that have come about in the last year. And there is a thirst from women and girls to actually do something. But it's how. You know, there is Sisters Uncut and Reclaim the Streets, Reclaim the Night and so on and so forth. But there are also many um, of their parents, particularly with younger women, um, saying, oh, be careful. You don't want to get arrested. Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do want to get arrested. And we have to somehow um, show and tell uh, women of all ages that it's OK to get arrested. It's OK to sit down on the on the ground and not move when the state tries to move you, um, uh, when there's such important issues at stake that are not being dealt with. And we see the, the police bill coming up at the moment and we need to all be opposing this and there should be, because nothing has ever changed in this country without civil disobedience. And we learned that from the suffragettes and uh, you know we learned about trade union stuff from the match women and so on. And I think uh, we need to have some kind of strategy henceforward, uh, henceforth to to, uh, to mobilise girls and women and say it's okay. Our place is not just in the home. It is out on the streets. It is being organising and, and uh, being part of collective with men as well. So um, have, the, have the panel got any ideas about how we can do this? 
Thank you, Carol. Thanks very much for that. Right. Okay. What we'll do now, we'll go back in order in terms of how people spoke and each panellist can have a few minutes to sum up uh, and indeed respond to any questions that have been asked. So over to you, please, first August, if you'd like to uh, unmute. Okay, good. Uh, again, uh, this has been uh, really enjoyable and uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, I think as everybody knows, and maybe this came up in previous discussions and I missed it, uh, the further Marx and Engels got away from the Paris Commune, their assessments were much more sober uh, about the Commune, the further they were away from it. Uh, Marx is uh, the Civil War in France, remember, it was, it was written in the heat, not exactly in the heat, but uh, right on the heels of the overthrow of the commune. And it was important to defend the commune. It was a defensive document in defense of the commune. But the later assessments are tended to be much more sober, especially uh, uh, the lack of a leadership, of a revolutionary leadership uh, of the commune. And Lenin, Lenin was intimately familiar with those later assessments. So it, so intimately familiar with it that Lenin actually, and I think correctly, uh, corrected uh, Engels. It was in 1891 where Engels, uh, in a debate uh, with the reformists in Germany, uh, argued that the uh, commune was the dictatorship of the proletariat. And uh, Marx never did. Marx never called uh, the commune, the dictatorship of the proletariat. And uh, Lenin, I think, correctly pointed out that the commune could not have been, could not have been the, uh, the dictatorship of the, of the, pro of the proletariat. Uh, the, the fact that it did not take the kind of despotic measures uh, on the property uh, with regard to the property of the bourgeoisie, certainly the bank, uh, the national bank uh, was for Lenin, crucial evidence about the a uh, fact that it was not, it could not have been the dictatorship of the proletariat. And I say this because uh, the leadership question I think is crucial. We have, to, we have to recognize the importance of revolutionary leadership and that insight, that all important insight that Lenin reached in 1901, in which he said that if, uh, if the working class did not have a revolutionary party in place, before the proverbial shit hits the fan, it would be too late. It would be too late to form a party in the heat, in the middle of the tumult of a revolutionary process. And I argue that that insight, that insight in 1901 on the part of uh, Lenin goes a long way in explaining why it is that the Bolsheviks, the Bolsheviks were hegemonic uh, in 1917 19, uh, uh, in leading the workers and peasants uh, to power. So I just wanted to uh, end uh, by uh, uh, with a, with a, um, a necessary sober assessment, not only the strengths of the, of the commune, but also uh, the weaknesses of the commune, the lack of revolutionary leadership. Thanks for that, August. It's really important to, you know, we can't obviously just, uh, what's the word, bang the drum today for the commune, can we? We also need to talk about the particular ways in which it, it didn't do things that we might have liked it to do. So that's very useful. Thank you. Right. OK, over to Lindsay now, who's already unmuted. So if you'd like to have your say, Lindsay, please. OK, thanks, Martin. And thanks to everybody who's contributed. I, felt, I think it's been a really, really useful discussion all day. And I just want to comment on a few things that have been said in the discussion. I mean, firstly, on Carol's point about the women's um, struggles that are going on at the moment, I think they're crucially important. We should remember the majority of union members in this country now are women. And to me, that's a very, very important thing. Um, you know, it's, it's quite, it goes quite against the sort of common view of what trade unions look like. But to me, it's not obviously exclusively trade union struggle, but I think this will be hugely important when you, as we are beginning to see, when you see a rise in the level of industrial conflict. So I think bringing together those different strands of women is the most, is the most important thing in a way. And uh, also for socialists to be very involved in it as many of our comrades have been and still are involved in campaigning. There was a big demonstration in Manchester yesterday. I was on one uh, on Monday in Parliament Square. Um, we're trying to get together a letter of, of uh, 
different women and so on to try and um, uh, you know take this kind of thing forward so I think yeah we've got a, this is this is going to be an important thing the point that Kate made about kind of can our rulers protect us you know that we've seen what they've been like in the Covid pandemic and I think this is a very important lesson as well because lots of what's going on now I think you have to look back to the Second World War to see uh, as big a crisis in terms of uh, British society. And of course, the British government couldn't protect its own citizens in the Second World War. It didn't build shelters. It didn't protect people properly. It was working class people who actually took the initiatives to establish many of the things that then became established. And uh, I think this is exactly how we've got to look at it. We don't want to go back to the old normal, but the new normal is only going to be won by struggle and by people trying to transform society themselves. And they will find in those uh, in those struggles, that, of course, the same people who oppose the Paris Commune and who still do today in France from Danielle's description will be the same people who are, who are opposing us having any control over our lives. So I think these are very, very important. That brings us to the question of democracy and what real democracy looks like and real democracy is superior to what we have now it is about every person having a say not leaving it to the as, as somebody was saying the discussion the professional advisors and the um uh, you know the spads and all the people you see in parliament and you know who you don't even notice when they're not around as they're not around most of the time now and th this is a totally different form of democracy. It's about working people deciding the priorities of society, what they want things to be spent on, all those different sorts of things. So important for us there as well. Just finally, is that when we talk about um, memory and looking back at history, this is something which every new generation tries to do. If you look at the upheaval around 68 produced some of the best works of history produced for the first time, history which looked at black history, or not for the first time, but one of the big developments which looked at black history, looked at women's history, where you have people like Sheila Rowbottom writing her books um, just after 68. And people, every time they're engaged in new struggle, they look back to what's happened in the past and they look back to what was done right and what was done wrong. And I just want to finally echo the point that, that um, has just been made by August over this, because you know, there's all sorts of interpretations of history going on, and we need to fight for a, a socialist interpretation of history, which talks about the possibility of democracy, talks about the possibility of how we can transform society and how that is much nearer than the vast majority of people in this country believe and how it is possible that working people can transform society. And that does need a political organization. So it's also a question of building political organization and giving the kind of leadership that we need in terms of winning these disputes and winning the much bigger disputes that are gonna be ahead. Thanks, Lindsay. It's very inspiring as ever. Um, it, indeed, and I think it's really important that so many of the speakers today have been coming back to where we are now, uh, because of course, that is really what we have the most control over. Of course, we can try and think about our history works, and it's very important that the right things are memorialised and that history is told from our side. But let's talk about the now and the here and now as well. OK, uh, next, I'm going to hand over to Danielle. Please, uh, you're already on mute if you'd like to have your say. Thank you. Yeah, some uh, complimentary words, no final words, because, of course, this uh, this is a conversation that needs to keep happening, and um, and it's been... The Paris Commune has been happening over two months and, and there are plenty of opportunities to, to, to talk about and discuss about it. And thank you again for really organizing this, this moment. So talking about the here and now and trying to maybe answer some of the questions that were asked, I, 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 uh, I won't be able to go into details, but um, uh, if you follow me on Twitter and, and on the social media, you could get a glimpse of what we've been trying to do uh, to actually uh, keep alive the legacies of the commune uh, and uh, and and uh, keep alive also the 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 dream or the the reality they've been trying to build uh, in uh, in in those uh, crucial days. Um, so here and now, what we are facing in in France and what is uh, the future of the prospects uh, are are could be pretty grim because we are actually 
experiencing um, a backlash, a, a, a reactionary authoritarian backlash from the, the government. I told you at first uh, at the, the beginning of my, my presentation that um, the government and Emmanuel Macron is actually celebrating Napoleon, which is a symbol for us on the left of uh, the man who crushed the, 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 the Great Revolution and, and how reactionary he was. And it's not, it's not just um, uh, because, you know, Napoleon is a well-known figure, but it means something in a, in a, in a time when, um, rather than being at war uh, against the COVID as he pretended to be, uh, Emmanuel Macron has been at war against the people. And uh, as I said, it, it really echoes with, with um, some of the things that happened uh, in those days, the idea that we are facing just like many people around the world and people in, in the UK, but the, the, um, the in, uh, incapacity and, and uh, the failure of our government uh, to face, uh, to face uh, the, the health crisis and uh, all the more the restriction of, of freedom. And, and there's a very um, uh, authoritarian turn by, by the government, which uh, is also ideologically very reactionary because we've been experiencing uh, um, attacks, uh, first, of course, uh, against against Muslim people. And I will, I will say this and, and the, the question of how we fight back against this. But it started with uh, Muslim people. But what we've seen and us, we've already seen in histories how targeting one group of people uh, quickly escalate into targeting everyone. And that's what we've been experiencing with, with the government itself leading the charge against academics, uh, the very academics who are actually working on uh, oppression, domination in France, and, and just like what we've witnessed, I suppose, in the UK too, and in, and in the US, this, this very reactionary anti anti-intersectional studies, anti-postcolonial studies, in the idea that um, it has to disqualify and try to prevent people from actually understanding what is happening and what makes uh, the, 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 the workings of oppression and domination. And there's this vicious attack happening. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, there are not many, 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 many um, traditional left organization actually taking a stand, whether it's defending our Muslim brothers and sisters or even fighting back against the, 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 the push against academic liberty. So uh, I, I would say it's, uh, it's, it could be very grim because it's, and in, in, in of course the COVID, COVID pandemic also puts a, put a damper on the mood, but at the same time, and that's what I, I find so inspiring and important in, in talking about La Commune is that that was a place of utter despair. I think we can't even imagine the situation those people were living. But they were able to, 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 to fight back and not just fighting back, but take back the, the, the power. And I think that's what we've seen also uh, over the past years in France, as I talk about the Yellow Vest movement uh, and, and even uh, the, 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 movement uh, uh, in solidarity with migrant people. Uh, I, I, there was also one, one thing I wanted to, to point at the time, at La Commune time, it was the way they used the migrant um, revolutionaries uh, to actually uh, denounce the Commune and saying it was from outside, foreigners actually doing that. It was very great, xenophobic. The, the people at Versailles and the government um, demonized the Commune also, uh, tell it, saying that it was from outside and it, it really echoes uh, what we've been witnessing in, in France. And at the same time, we got those solidarity movements happening. And I think that's what we've been uh, working on and, and, and getting people together to not only uh, stand firm on our principle, fight back, but also um, try and build a platform where we will uh, face the power of the state and take over the power of the state. We got a, a presidential election uh, next year, which is very crucial because at the time, uh, right now, uh, the old system, the entire system is trying to uh, just put the, the, the debate should be uh, excluding everybody, but Macron and Le Pen from the debate and saying uh, already it's, it's a done deal. You'll have to vote to, to choose between Macron uh, or Le Pen at the second round, and and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a constant uh, propaganda that is being being uh, put.
pushed for people to lose hope actually because because it's it's a it's a lose lose situation and uh, and so it's it's very important and all the movement that have been happening are very important for that and and especially uh, standing back with the people standing standing strong with the people who are uh, who are who are uh, uh, demonized and and uh, and especially with the rising Islamophobia, of course. Uh, just to to um, say one last thing about uh, the religion factor. It's very interesting because at the time at La Comine, there's a, there's this very distinct movement against the the the, the Catholic Church and the idea, especially women uh, who freed themselves from from the, the church and we've been and teachers. Uh, but at the same time, people saying like we want to separate the state and and the church. That was the first actually laicite moment, uh, if you know about French history and the way uh, laicite has been uh, also weaponized against against the people. But at the time, they were just saying that we want to, to free our mind. It's an emancipatory movement. But the very people who were doing that who could go. Uh, in the morning, they would go to the church, and in the afternoon, they would go to the club and to the to the political club, and and it it was not a contradiction. And I think it's very uh, also an interesting uh, uh, moment uh, at at the time. So um, yeah, so I, I will end with this, this with the idea that uh, despite whatever the ruling class is trying to do, and they've been very aggressive in doing this in France, the people, ordinary people, um, are more just more more uh, more pragmatic than that and and would rather find common goals uh, get together uh, resist together stand back together than being divided and I think that's that's really what I think uh, is, is is important this lesson and especially now that despite all the the, the, the way they are trying to divide us uh, we we are standing together and and people do build, do I mean, Objectively, in the day-to-day -day lives, uh, they they fight alongside together against COVID and stuff like that, and and uh, and that's what's the reality, and that's where we have to build from. And uh, the fact that there's this very uh, disconnect between the what the work ruling class is trying to do and what the, the the working class is actually living experiencing, and we have to to build from the experiences of the working class, which is much more about unity, about common goals and common fight that. Uh, that the contrary and and that's one of yeah that the the, the the last thing i wanted to emphasize and thank you very much well thank you daniel thanks ever so much for coming and did it and indeed i think streaming the event on your facebook page i believe as well if that's happened i think that was happening wasn't it so there'll be all sorts of people hopefully watching it indeed all over the world as well as via this and indeed the facebook version of this too okay if we can come to our last uh, speaker to come back and respond to any comments and generally summarize over to you shabir please Thanks a lot. Um, and I, I agree with, with what um, has been said. I think it's been fantastic contributions. I just wanted to touch on, on a couple of points um, and hopefully put them in a coherent way. I think the first was on, on the question of, of state violence. And, um, you know, I think we live in a supposedly liberal society where we're free to do what we want and so on. Um, and I think the moments where the state shows us a glimpse of what it actually does when its authority is challenged is shocking for people. Um, but I think we need to firstly argue that even um, when the state is not, you know, clamping down on protesters and tear gassing them and arresting them and the rest of it, um, that they are responsible for violence against the working people every day. I mean, what else would you call allowing 130,000 people to die completely avoidably? Um, but I think even in those moments, like we saw at, at the Sarah Everard uh, vigil in Clapham Common, we need to continually challenge the idea that these are isolated events. And I think, um, you know, Chris said it well um, about the importance of, of the memory and, and why we're having events like this, because it is an example of, of what the state does. Um, and, and, and we need to remind people about it and, and why the, the excuses, because there are always excuses to justify them, COVID regulations at the moment, um, you know, just like, the war in Iraq was about liberating people are nonsense. Um, and I think they helped to, to, to add to the argument that these issues are, are systemic and fundamental and that they cannot just be reformed away uh, in parliament, but have to come uh, from below. Um, I think the point about the kind of democracy we need and, and that we can take inspiration from the commune from uh, is really important. And I think this is important also 
um, in the struggle itself uh, and not just a question of what happens uh, kind of a post-revolution because I think there are um, some ideas in in the movements that you know all you need is a few people to take direct action uh, at a certain time and get themselves arrested and all the rest of it um, or, or you know applying conditions on on who can be part of a movement whether it's you know based on identity or the rest of it um, and I think the commune showed us that that what we need is participatory movement we need uh, you know the mass of society uh, in a democratic fashion being a part of the struggle. In, in order to, to transform society. Um, I think one other thing that the commune showed us is that there are no secondary issues. Um, you know, we came up uh, against this a lot uh, in the last five years, uh, you know, when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader of, of, of the opposition that we had, uh, you know, we, we should only talk about, uh, you know, renationalizing railways. Let's not talk about imperialism. Let's not talk about racism or the rest of it. But no, these are part and parcel of the kind of society we want to build. And we have to make these arguments and win these arguments in the here and now. Um, and, and, you know, Marx said it the best way, he said the direct antithesis uh, to the empire was the commune. And I think that's that's the kind of spirit we need to carry on. And I'll just end with, and, and it's really hard to summarize such a brilliant, uh, you know, uh, event with so many great contributions, but just that I think we are entering into a period of uh, of intensified struggle, arguably already are. And I think as revolutionaries, uh, we need to build and connect these struggles uh, and generalize them as much as we possibly can. And I think um, they, you know, they can't just happen in a vacuum. I think uh, we need revolutionary organization to do this. And, and I think that's exactly what Counterfy is trying to do. It's why we've put on this event and it's what we do with our, with our website, with our local groups around the country. Uh, and the rest of it. And so if, if you're not already a member, I would really encourage people um, to, to join today. And yeah, thanks again. Thank you, Shabir. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks, everyone. Just a few comments before we go. I was actually going to say something about joining Counterfy, but I feel as like you, you've just said it 10 seconds ago, I won't just repeat exactly the same points. But yes, I mean, there's been lots of comments in the chat about how we do this, how we do that, how we organise. And, you know, obviously that's what we're here for. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to do with as many people as possible. So do consider joining. I just wanted to briefly say something as well. I can't, apologies if someone's already said this, but there's a perhaps apocryphal story, isn't it? The, the day the Bolshevik revolution went past 72 days, Lenin danced in the snow because it had beaten the commune. I don't know. I mean, it's a story that probably many of us know, but I do think true or not, that tells us something about what the importance of this was and how it absolutely instilled the importance of organization and how to take state power into the minds of the generations of revolutionaries that came afterwards. Um, quick reminder before we go as well about our next Marxist forum, which some of you will have already heard about, which is next Saturday at uh, two o'clock. It's Elaine Graham Lee, who's been on the call today talking about women's oppression and its roots in class society. So do consider joining us for that. And, uh, all that's to be said is do go off and enjoy the rest of your Sundays. And uh, thanks very much for coming. Thank you.